It is 6.30. It is time for us to begin. So if you would take a seat, speakers. Can't hear me? Turn it, get up a little. Is this better? You want to crank it up a bit more? There's a delicate point here at which if it gets cranked up too high, I think that if it gets cranked up too high, you start getting feedback. You don't want that. Uh, this is a regular Glastonbury Town Council meeting. My colleagues are sitting to my right. I'll uh, meet them later this evening. Our invited guest left. My name is I'm the chair. We begin all our meetings with the Legion. Ask Jill Perry to uh, just pass. Jill. Um, Welcome. Room looks to be about full. Uh, let me just share with you. I'm going to tell you something you already know. We're here this evening out of concern that the actions of a very few, very foolish individuals are endangering the lives of themselves. Uh, this thing of you, rather, tonight, evening. All here try um there is a sign in sheet. Please uh on a sign in. I'll three names. First follow them first after that. There are index cards open, so that if you have a question, don't ask it during your two minutes of public comment. Write the question down. We're going to do ten speakers, five questions. Ten speakers, five questions. And we'll get through this. Um, our invited speakers this evening, I will get to in just a moment. They have six to seven minutes uh, to sort of set the stage for your discussion and your input. I will then open the meeting uh, to our guests. Uh, you will have two minutes to speak. That's about one page. Ten-point font, double-spaced. So if you've done your uh, comments there and they run to five pages, start editing now. Um, because this is a council meeting, the way we begin normally is that when we have a question to deal with, and we do this evening, what can we do about a problem that we have, uh, we invite the town manager to give us a brief overview. So at this point, I'd like to invite Richard Johnson up here to provide that overview. Thank you, Mr. Galata. Thanks, Mr. Galata. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, as Mr. Galata just mentioned, uh, I was asked to provide uh, an overview and summary of some of the factors and circumstances and influences that led to this evening's forum. And while tonight's meeting is being held in Glastonbury, I think it's important to note that some of the issues and concerns that will be discussed this evening are certainly not isolated to Glastonbury and their experience in communities throughout Greater Hartford and across the state and I know that there are some public officials from other communities that are going to speak and lend their thoughts to the discussion this evening. I also think it's important to indicate that cities and towns are very often faced with difficult decisions and difficult problems. And as uh, Mr. Galata just mentioned, this is a we uh, issue. And I do think that there are solutions and there are steps that need to be taken 
but like any issue that we face, sometimes there's not one easy solution. And I think we need to hear comments and work through some of the, uh, some of the options. For Glastonbury, over recent months, we've experienced a, uh, an uptick in our thefts of motor vehicles, thefts from motor vehicles, in most cases, these crimes are committed by juveniles and young people. And there's a whole host of related incidents that go with those fundamental uh, thefts of vehicles and thefts from motor vehicles. Give you some statistics. Between 19 and 20 uh, motor vehicle thefts in Glastonbury have quadrupled from 19 to 75. And thefts from motor vehicles have doubled, more than doubled, from 107 to 220. I think for those of us who work at Town Hall and for the police, what's particularly troubling is there is an in the, involve, the evolving manner and perhaps boldness of some of the crimes that we've seen uh, in Glastonbury. They occur at all times of day and night, all areas of our community. Uh, we have uh, people entering others' garages, entering driveways, weapons displayed, and a week or two ago, shots fired at a homeowner at two or three o'clock in the morning when she opened her door after seeing strangers in her driveway. Uh, we've had some motor vehicle accidents where young people are fleeing and they've gotten into motor vehicle accidents with stolen cars that have involved others that are simply driving down the road. Those are clearly not good situations for anybody, for the homeowner, for the young person, for anybody is not a good situation. Uh, the police, I think, will say that there are challenges and that many times uh, the young people act with impunity because they know that there are very few consequences to their actions. And if you look at Glastonbury, when we're asked very often, what can we do? If you're familiar with town, Glastonbury is about 52 and a half square miles. And between the river, which is right over those trees, and when you head east to Hebron, it's about 8 to 10 miles. And we have about 250 road miles in town with neighborhoods and commercial areas. So it's, it's a real challenge for us. And it's a, a particularly difficult when you have... Uh, repeat uh, offenders. Property owners in Glastonbury have modified their behavior. They lock their cars, they remove key fobs, they lock garage doors, they remove valuables from their cars, they don't leave cars idling any longer, all at the advice, and some of that may seem like common sense, and in large part it probably is, but I do think there is a reasonableness test that should be met. And let me give you some just recent examples. As Mr. Galata mentioned, I was asked to kind of set a little bit of the stage from the Glastonbury experience. I don't think it's unreasonable for someone, we've probably all done this, arrive home and bring groceries from the car to the kitchen and back without coming out and finding your car stolen. Uh, several weeks ago, that's a situation we had where somebody was delivering groceries, moving them from the car to the kitchen, come back, the car is gone. If you're outside on a Saturday afternoon doing yard work, you should be able to leave your garage door open without coming back and finding people in your garage looking to perhaps steal your car or steal valuables, and we've had that experience. As recent as 5 a.m. this morning, a Hartford Current delivery person stopped had a multiple drops, five, six, seven, ran up to drop, left the vehicle item, came back, and it was gone. Five o'clock in the morning. And uh, I just mentioned a homeowner got up in the middle of the night, uh, looked out the window, people in the driveway, uh, went to the door to see what was going on, and two shots were fired. Those two shots hit the house. They could have hit her, uh, but they hit the house that time. So I think there is a bit of a reasonableness test that needs to somehow be addressed and, and we think we need help from our state legislature. But we also know it's not an easy problem, it's not an easy issue, and we know it involves people of all ages, property owners, and young people. 
Some of the emotions we've heard in Glastonbury have been anger, fear, uh, concern. I don't know if the group is here tonight, but we have a safe, safe streets group that has, uh, there they are. And we've also had some thoughts of neighborhood watch programs, which each in and of itself can bring some challenges for police and, and homeowners. So uh, when the Glassbury Town Council had constituents and property owners appearing at meetings and asking what the town council could do, calling my office, calling Chief Porter and asking what we could do, we looked first to have a series of public meetings, but then clearly recognized that this issue goes far beyond the borders of Glastonbury and decided to have this evening's forum and reach out uh, to surrounding communities. And again, I know there are a number uh, here uh, being represented. So that's how the forum came together. As Mr. Galata started this evening's comments, this is a we issue, and the goal is to look for solutions that work for everyone uh, in this e issue and meet a reasonable test uh, in my mind. Uh, the current situation uh, in my mind should not and cannot uh, continue. Before I turn the podium back to Mr. Galata, I just want to introduce Chief Marshal Porter sitting in the front row. Uh, Marshal is Glastonbury's. <laughs> Boy, that's, uh, that's a pretty nice reception, I'll tell you. Wow. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, Chief Porter has been very much involved representing the Glassbury Police Department from establishing an internal, uh, from inter uh, establishing, thank you. Uh, chief Porter has been very much involved, as you would expect, as a police chief in Glastonbury, uh, establishing a local task force, working with other communities, working with chiefs of police across the country, improving our access or your access to crime data on our website, uh, providing education and uh, uh, tips for homeowners and the list goes on and on. And we will continue that devotion and that uh, effort on behalf of Glassbury residents and all. But as you will hear later this evening, we need a little bit of help and we need some help from our state legislators. So with that, I'll turn the podium back to Mr. Galata, who's right behind me. Thank you. For those folks who are short, we have to bring the uh, microphone back down. All right, so let's get uh, on to business and who I think you want to hear this evening. Each of our primary speakers will begin um, their initial discussion with you, your conversation for six to eight minutes. Uh, Chief Pac Patrick Reinhauer, president of the Connecticut Police Chiefs Association. He um, is also the Chief of Police for Danbury, Connecticut. So Chief, uh, you can either speak there or come up here, whichever you prefer. Can everyone hear me? Okay, good evening everyone, and it's uh, wonderful to see this uh, assembly to address uh, the concerns with regard to particularly auto theft, but uh, the ancillary effects or, or the, the more serious consequences that uh, occur with these auto thefts. Just very quickly, um, a couple of weeks ago on Father's Day um, in our city of Danbury, a uh, stolen vehicle on one side of town, uh, juveniles involved, ended up in a drive-by shooting homicide of a teenager on the other side of town. So uh, these are, it's, for, for me, I don't, I don't need six to eight minutes because right now I'm just here to listen to, for, to you to say that the resources of the Connecticut Police Chiefs Association are here uh, so that we can work on this problem together uh, with our legislation. And um, so I'm just gonna turn it over to our next, which is uh, Chief State's Attorney Richard Colangelo. Thanks, Chief. It's just not you, Marshal, I guess it's me too. Um, I want to echo what Chief Rittenhauer said. Um, uh, feedback or? Oh, no. 
Um, I, I just wanted to echo what, what Chief Rednauer said. I mean, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, our primary purpose really is, is to listen, um, to try and get some ideas, uh, to see what we can do as a, a criminal justice system. Uh, with me is, is Deputy Chief uh, State Attorney John Rosado. John has been with the division for more than 25 years. He's been the Deputy Chief of Administration for 15 plus. So all the administrative stuff, he's my right hand with, with this kind of stuff. Um, and she's gonna speak next, but uh, you know, Sue Hamilton, uh, the public, the Chief Public Defender's Office, uh, who handles all the juvenile matters. Um, you know, we are kind of a team on this stuff, trying to figure out how to address it. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the op-ed that I did uh, at the beginning of this week. Um, I don't want there to be any confusion in what I was trying to say. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying in any way, shape, or form that the answer is to detain or lock these kids up, this group of kids that we're talking about. Right? We need to figure out a way to give them the services that they need to make a determination, you know, what's causing the problem. Right? If you were to come up to me and say, Rich, tell me about yourself. First thing I tell you is I'm a parent. Right? I've got four kids. Right? As a parent, you know, I want to find out why my kids are doing something. So as a society, we have to look at that and say, why are these kids committing the acts that they're committing? Not what is wrong with them, but what happened to them, and address that. If we do, and we give them the services they need to address it, we give them tools they need to you know, get jobs or skills to prevent them from committing these acts, then it's gonna be a lot better for us as society, because then they're not gonna end up as adult criminals. And that's great for all of us. So I wanna kind of frame the discussion around that. I, I see some shaking heads on no, and we don't agree with that, and, and I understand it, um, but that's kind of where we as society have to be, because what we're doing now is not working. And that's really why we're here. Hey, thank you. Hey, please. There's something about Glastonbury that we all re should remember. We deal in civil discussion, okay? Not that people necessarily agree with us, but tonight's going to be a civil discussion, please. Uh, Susan Hamilton, Director of Delinquency Defense and Child Protection. works out great. Um, I just, I guess I, I will follow suit with um, my uh, colleagues that are on the, oh, you can't, can, is that better? Okay, I'll yell a little bit. Um, I just will follow suit um, with my colleagues on the panel tonight to just, first of all, say that we appreciate um, the town council and the delegation and others that are here for inviting us to be part of this conversation. Um, and uh, while I know we'll have lots of opportunities to um, have dialogue and answer questions, my understanding about tonight's session in part is to try to hear from all of you about what you see as some of the possible solutions, what's working, what's not. And I think it's important if we're talking about legislative reform, and I will just you know, mention this briefly, is that it's important if we're talking about that as a potential solution, that we also have an understanding about what does the law currently allow? Because there are tools in the toolbox that I think as a system we need to use, and I'm not necessarily up here promoting increased detention, increased transfer to adult court, but I think there are tools that exist that we need to look at how they are working. Are they being used? If they're not being used, what do we need to do as a system to try to use those in a more effective way? We, as I see it as a community, we have a shared um, responsibility, obligation to not only help protect public safety and, and, and the community, but also to help promote better outcomes for youth, decrease recidivism. And what I struggle with sometimes in these conversations is that those two things or that myriad of things oftentimes seems to be discussed as an either or. You know, like they're mutually exclusive goals and we can't really do one without the other. So I would just um, echo the, the, the feedback about trying to be um, creative and thoughtful about what exists, exists now, what's working, and how can we as a, as a system uh, do better. So I, I appreciate being part of the conversation and um, uh, thank you for um, being here tonight. Representative Joe Barry, you're next. Thank you. Can you hear me? <laughs> I have a little bit more to say. <laughs> um, first, good evening. I'd like to thank Richard Johnson and the Glastonbury Town Council for hosting this important event. I would also like to thank all panel members for not only being here tonight, but for all the work that you have done on this issue. 
Thank you for fielding my phone calls and answering my endless questions. You are appreciated. Welcome to Glastonbury. Despite some of the things you will hear tonight, this is truly a wonderful town. And to you, the residents, thank you for your advocacy and concern for our amazing town. We are here because of you. And you are the fuel that keeps me going in this fight. I have spoken to many of you, and if I have, you will know that I have been dedicated to this problem way before it became an all hands on deck forum kind of problem. This is not a new problem. This is not just a Glastonbury problem. However, we are Glastonbury. Today is today. And we have gotten to the point where we do not feel safe in our homes, our yards, our cars. We fear for our children and the thought of them riding their bikes, playing outside, and waiting at the bus stop in five short weeks is terrifying. I get it. I am a resident. I am a parent. I am scared to be alone in my house, not only at, at night, but during the day. Scared to get gas, bring in groceries. This is happening in your neighborhood. This is happening in my neighborhood. I share your fears and your calls for action. Fortunately for you, I have a voice in Hartford. I am not always heard, but I am loud and I am persistent. And I will not stop until something is done. In recent months, there seems to be a lot of finger pointing at the police, judicial departments, the victims, which is shameful. But the fact of the matter is that all of these parties have been at the table for months, talking about the problems, possible solutions, offering legislative language, and also the warning that if corrective action did not occur, these crimes would escalate to, dare I say, this point. The question that begs to be answered is, when are we going to start placing blame where it belongs, on the offenders? Where are the consequences? What are the deterrents? <laughs> Thank you. I had initial conversations with Mr. Colangelo and discuss his agency's proposed legislation. It was brilliant <laughs> and very, and provided very concrete, doable solutions. And as much as I love talking to Chief Porter, there are only so many times that he can detail the problems, possible solutions, and for me to bring these proposals to legislative leaders, get excited that something will be done, only to be let down again and again and again by the majority of legislators who did not perceive this to be a problem, were quick to victim shame, pass it off as a suburban problem, thought the solutions too harsh, or simply lacked the courage to act. I do not have the solutions, but they do. Law enforcement, the state attorney, prosecutors. However, their pleas fell on deaf legislative ears. And here we are, the result of no action. So what do we do today, starting now? Enough of the finger pointing, enough of the blame. We need action. Here are some solutions that I will continue to fight for. Number one, the biggest ask from law enforcement is access to juvenile criminal background data. Currently, this information is privileged and cannot be accessed at local police departments. So for example, if Glastonbury police arrest a juvenile, they can see that person's prior record in Glastonbury. However, they are not privy to information on that juvenile for crimes committed in other towns. So it may be their first offense in Glastonbury. However, they may have committed and been arrested four, five, eight, ten times in other towns. Good news in this area, there is talk and support for having a probation employee on call 24-7 where judges and or law enforcement could call and get background information on a juvenile. This would assist police and judges in making the decision to detain. My recent conversations have indicated that this is an administrative fix, not legislative. If that is the case, <laughs> If 
If that is the case, this process could be initiated quite quickly, like in a couple of weeks. This would be a huge win. Number two, as far as detaining, there needs to be some flexibility in how long a juvenile can and should be detained. Having a standard six hour time frame is not really feasible. Police should be able to hold if it is in the best interest of public safety. Hold until a juvenile can be re released to a responsible adult, parent, guardian, or otherwise, instead of just being released to themselves or dropped off at home. Also, parents should have some say. For example, if a parent feels it is in the best interest of the child to remain in custody, that is, if they ask the officer to hold them longer. Number three, the transfer of serious juvenile offenders to adult court. This would grant them access to beneficial services and diversionary efforts. Currently, these programs are very limited in the juvenile sector after the closure of several detention facilities. However, these services that provide results are available in the adult sector. Number four, stricter consequences for crimes, violating parole and probation, requiring repeat offenders to be subject to house arrest in which the offender will be required to stay at home with approved exceptions, either through electric monitoring and or a global positioning device. This should be coupled with consistent consistent alcohol and drug testing, and again, consequences for failure to comply with the said terms. I believe that these steps would have a positive impact on our communities and create a deterrent against future offenses. Recently, the town council wrote a letter to Governor Lamont detailing the horrendous acts that are occurring in Glastonbury not only the uptick in crime, but also the high-speed car chases on a Sunday afternoon and gunshots targeted at residents. A short time after, I received a call from the governor's office, truly expressing his shock and commitment to help. Soon after, he announced $5 million that would be earmarked for violence prevention and enforcement, including car thefts. Though I do not have the breakout of the funds in a conversation with the governor's office yesterday, I am told that Glastonbury, along with other targeted towns, would be the recipient of a grant to pay for increased police patrols, overtime, and other related costs for regional task forces, a tactic that Glastonbury has already initiated. <laughs> I will close with how I began. This is not a suburban problem. Crime in urban areas is three to five times higher in the suburb, in the, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is not a suburban problem. Crime in urban areas is three to five times higher than it is in the suburbs. However, our voices are the loudest right now. From the, our voices are the loudest right now. From the suburban communities, from the suburban legislators. But I ask you, who is speaking up for the victims in the, in the cities? They're <laughs> their legislators are failing them with their silence. Be louder, thank you. Our next speaker is Jason Doucette, representative for uh, Manchester and Glastonbury. Well, thanks everyone, first of all, for being here tonight. Um, and I want to especially thank our panelists for being here. Um, we have uh, the experts uh, in the state uh, of Connecticut on these issues, and these are the people who have a seat at the table. These are the people that know the issues best. So it's wonderful to have them here and that we collectively uh, can offer our input uh, to them, uh, uh, again, as they have a seat at the table uh, internally as some of the discussions going on as we get further into the weeds um, on these details. And um, I, um, I want to thank Representative Barry. Uh, her and I are very much on the same page and on the same team. She uh, described a lot what I was going to talk about getting into the weeds on the details on uh, these proposals. 
Um, I think she alluded to the fact that sometimes we are very much uh, swimming upstream um, at the legislature. Uh, you have 187 uh, legislators up there. You have the hierarchy of leadership. Uh, we do our best to raise our voices uh, when we can, and uh, sometimes we meet resistance. And um, this legislative session, uh, this issue was under discussion because I think it very much, uh, we know, started to escalate um, in uh, January when we convened the session. Um, I, I think the really the most sort of jarring incident, I believe, uh, for me was um, hearing about what happened at Woodfield Crossing uh, with uh, an incident there where a gun was pulled and, and many um, you know, cars and, and homes were burglarized. Uh, that happened in November, I believe, of, uh, of 2020. So we've, we've no doubt seen this escalate. And certainly what happened uh, just in the last month is unacceptable, unacceptable. And uh, for... <laughs> You know, for better or for worse, I think it's caught the attention of uh, people throughout the state. The two incidents, specifically in Glastonbury, that happened um, in the last month uh, have caught the attention, uh, and, and we have people listening now. Some of our colleagues in Hartford who were a little resistant to have this conversation uh, have been listening a little bit more intently. Um, so um, I, I think because it has escalated, there's no question in my mind, I'm singularly focused on this issue. This is the number one issue, and uh, we need action now. So uh, what is uh, the solution? Um, uh, Jill alluded to um, a lot of the things that I think um, are important that are under discussion now. There are discussions happening. Again, I, I think uh, it took us to this point to, to get to have people in the room, but there are bipartisan discussions uh, happening at the leadership level, uh, the, uh, the chairs of the Judiciary Committee. Um, so, so what are those solutions? I think Jill outlined them very well. To me, it is clear, um, though, and uh, that we need more pre-adjudication intervention for juveniles. So, so what does that mean? That means before adjudication, after arrest, and before adjudication, especially for those repeat offenders, because every chief in the state can tell you that we have a real problem with repeat offenders. So on the second uh, offense, uh, they are let go to the parents, guardians, uh, and then the third offense happens 24 hours, 48 hours later, and on and on and on. So uh, we need uh, pre-adjudication interventions. And I think it, as we get into the weeds um, a little bit, I think uh, the Chief State's Attorney and Attorney Hamilton uh, will agree that there are some of those tools that are available now, um, but they're not being utilized to their fullest degree. There's no question about that. Um, because we can't have a situation where there's somebody, whether it's three or four or 13, as we heard, um, in New Britain offenses um, who, who has, thir has that many offenses um, that has not had the appropriate level of, um, of intervention. So uh, we need to determine um, that uh, the programs that are available and are in existence now are available for those offenders. And yes, detention if it is warranted. And if the judge needs to make that determination as soon as possible, so the uh, second offense doesn't turn into the third and to the fourth. And um, as Jill alluded to, there are some administrative fixes to this that we're told that the data can be made available both to police and to the judges. The judges don't even have this if it's a middle of the night type of thing. And a uh, police officer has requested uh, a, uh, a detainer for detention for that uh, juvenile because uh, the police believe that there's a risk to public safety, that the judge in the middle of the night doesn't have access to all the information that they need to make that determination. They don't know how many prior arrests um, or incidents that that juvenile has been involved in. So, so that can happen evidently, administratively. I think these things are easier said than done. Uh, I had a discussion today with the chair of the Judiciary Committee, and he said, well, we're talking to judicial. They have uh, a lot of requirements in order to make that happen. There's technology. We've got to make sure the judges and, you know. So I am hopeful. I am somewhat optimistic that it is uh, an administrative change that can happen quickly. Um, but uh, be rest assured that Representative Barry, the Rep Senator Cassano, and myself will be pushing for that to happen sooner rather than later. 
Um, so what is, what is soon? What is soon as possible? Um, in my mind, it uh, could be next week. Uh, it could be next month. But beyond that, we, we know we can't wait any longer. We know we can't wait any longer for something meaningful uh, to happen. So I, and, and, and what does that mean? I'll be very direct. I do want to see a special session as soon as possible to address this. I do want to see a special session. Um, now, again, uh, I'll tell you a couple of things about that. Typically, we uh, will have a special session when there is a piece of legislation formulated, um, and that is what this bipartisan group is working on right now. And again, I'm being told that progress is being made, but I myself am getting a little impatient, and I'll continue to get uh, impatient every day, every week uh, that it goes longer. I've made my feelings known, and Jill said as she, she has um, as well. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I, I, um, the other thing I'll mention too, again, as I said, uh, we are three out of 187, to, so to make a special session happen, it's not, it's not just from us. You may have heard that uh, legislators can sign petitions, but again, if you get one, two, three, four petitions, it only gets you so far. So um, I, I think we, this does need to be, it's a statewide problem. Uh, it needs to be addressed as such. We need our colleagues. Uh, we have uh, Representative Kerry Wood here tonight from Rocky Hill, who I think is very much on the same page with us as well. Sorry to call you out, Kerry, but uh, she's uh, the one who's here. Um, so we, 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 need, we need to uh, make this a statewide issue. Um, and I think that's part of what we're doing here tonight. Again, we have um, the, the statewide leaders uh, on these issues, and we can be part of the solution. So I look forward to hearing from you uh, tonight, and thank you. Senator Cassano, Glastonbury, Manchester, and Points West. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for taking the time to be here tonight. Um, I expected a crowd. Uh, about a year ago, I had a conversation with a good friend here in Glastonbury, and as you know, Glastonbury's next. He says, what do you mean? If you've read the papers and read the Citizen and read the Current like I have over the last year, you saw that Marlboro, Hebron, were going through this on a regular basis. These criminals aren't foolish. They're not stupid. We've got a history, if you look at the top 10 television movies of the last decade, The Sopranos. How much time have we spent watching organized crime and so on on television? This is a new version of the same organized crime that goes back to the days of the mafia, and it is well organized. They started, <clears throat> they weren't stupid, they started in Marlboro and Hebron, which has no police department. Think about that. They got bold enough and good enough at it and organized enough to do what they're doing here in Glastonbury today. And we've got to stop them. I saw a sign outside as I tried to think of different ways how we stop them. One of those was get rid of second chance. I wouldn't vote for that, to be very honest with you. And I'll tell you why. Many of you are parents. If you're all like my parents and one of our children screw up, which we tend to do at least once or twice in our lives, that second chance bill has been wonderful. I have met personally with a parent right here in Glastonbury. I have met with several where the children have done some dumb, stupid thing that could jeopardize college, career, hiring, all those other kinds of things if they have a court record. So the purpose of the bill was not to deal with these types of thieves we're talking about. It's to talk about our children and to protect our children when they do that one dumb thing that might change their lives, hopefully in a positive way because they'll learn from it. How do you respond? That's another thing. I ask, most of you having difficulty sleeping at night. How many of you are getting up looking out the window and so on? Please. If you do look out the window and you do see something, don't turn on the lights. Don't make them aware that you know. Call the police department. 
keep those lights on. You can talk in the dock, dial that phone, but please don't let people know, these people, that you see them because we know what happened when the woman turned the light on. They shot it. So your own safety, have to put your own safety first. React, call the police quickly. Not your neighbor, not your husband, not your wife, not anybody else. Call the police department immediately in the dark if it's at night. This will subside. We'll win because the people are together on this. I think you're going to see more neighborhood action, more neighborhood involvement. Uh, and when you see that, these people know. They're going to see it. Like I said, they started where there were no police. When there's organized activity to prevent them from doing what they're trying to do, they're going to go somewhere else. We're not going to stop them but you'll drive them out of Glastonbury. And I think that's important. More important, hopefully, those phone calls to the police department may cut those numbers down of the people that are involved in this. These are, these are criminals. They live to steal, to rob, to hurt. They don't care what they do. They don't care who's in the way. They're not the brightest bulbs in the world when they just take guns and randomly shoot so we have to be careful. Protect yourself first, please. Thank you. OK. Um, we're now going to begin with our speakers. Uh, I'm going to read off three names. Uh, you'll find there's the podium. And behind that are two spots. Uh, if the speakers will, uh, uh, future speakers will stand in those spots, we'll move through this fairly quickly. Uh, we begin with State Representative Kerry Wood, followed by uh, First Selectman Susan Bransfield, followed by Deputy uh, General Manager Stephen Stefano. And this is the first example of me crucifying a name. Uh, uh -huh. We're going to see much of this this evening. Two, two Hello? minutes. Is this on? Can everyone hear me? Hi, thank you everyone uh, for having us. I want to thank the public for being here with such big numbers. Um, I'm very saddened that we're here because of a death and injury and being shot at. Uh, since 2019, uh, many of us in the central Connecticut area have been hearing from people like Fran Carino and law enforcement that this was escalating and it was gonna get to this point. And our goal was to put forward le legislation so that it wouldn't get to this point. We have been as my, my good colleague who is a leader on this issue can say, it has fallen on deaf ears. We have put forward good legislation that has failed on the House floor, and now we're here because of horrific incidents. So I just wanna let people know, I think we've heard what's going on in the, le in the, legislature, uh, in the legislature that there is a working group that is talking about ankle brace monitoring, uh, juvenile database, even looking at the pursuit policy, all of those, discuss the, those discussions are going on now. But I do want to say that I am ready to change the laws. I have been ready, and you have support in me, and I'm really looking forward to going into special session to get, to get this done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Susan, you're next. Uh, what, I'd ask each of the speakers to please identify yourself and just give us a sense of where you're coming from. Sure. As in community. Sure. Um, <clears throat> my name is Susan Bransfield. I'm the first select woman in the town of Portland. I've had the job for quite a few years. And uh, as we all know, those who have served in public service, there are problems that occur on a daily basis. Um, and certainly, as a chief elected official in a community, this type of crime that uh, you're discussing here tonight with the city council is so very important. Um, I want to thank Glastonbury for inviting me, as well as other town officials and residents here tonight. Um, certainly the solidarity shown is important. Um, I don't pretend to have solutions tonight. I know some of the speakers asked for solutions. This is a very complicated problem. But I know that with all the brilliant minds in here, and I think let's emphasize the goodwill that we have that we all, no matter where we live, are entitled to a good life. 
and everyone fairly needs to be treated. So I encourage our legislators and our officials that protect us to always remember that. Um, certainly, that's the theme that I think we're operating under here. Um, I did ask our police department um, to give me some information. We're a town just bordering here in Glastonbury. In Portland, we have 9,300 people, and we have been affected by these random crimes um, similar to Glastonbury and to other towns in our community. Um, the night that a Glastonbury resident was shot at after confronting suspects on her property, Portland also had vehicles that were broken into. Um, very often, it's the same suspects that may be in one town coming over into the other town. There's really no borders. We all share this problem, and that's why I'm here tonight to let you know how important it is to all of us to come to a solution. Between January 1, 2020 and July 21, 2021, in Portland, there were 14 stolen motor vehicles in our town, as well as, and this is a big number for Portland, 100 larcenies from motor vehicles during that same time period. This is a problem. We need to analyze why we're here. We need to come up with the solutions, and most importantly, it's just great to see that we're all going to work together regardless of where we live. So I look forward to joining this town and the other cities and towns in Connecticut to remember Connecticut's a great place to live because of the people that are here. So thank you very much for the thank opportunity. You, Susan. Deputy General Manager Stephen Stefano, followed by Police Captain Anthony Palumbazizo. Not close. I, I feel, Anthony, Tony. I feel yes. good because the only person with a harder name to pronounce is Captain Palumbazizo. So my, my name is Steve Stefano. I'm the Acting General Manager for the Town of Manchester. Uh, thank you to Town Manager Johnson and the, the Council for inviting us here. Uh, Manchester's facing the same issues as Glastonbury, um, and our town council board of directors unanimously passed a resolution to address the issue with a, a local subcommittee, but obviously it's a statewide issue that requires a regional response. Uh, happy to be here on behalf of Manchester. Uh, the captain will give more information just about what we're facing from a law enforcement standpoint, uh, but a regional problem requires a regional response, and. Uh, Manchester is happy to be part of the solution, so thanks for inviting us. Thank you. <laughs> Anthony, you're next, followed by Sean Grant. I'm going to speak on behalf. Okay. I want to thank everybody tonight uh, for allowing us uh, to come here and speak on behalf of Manchester uh, and also possibly sharing some of the solutions uh, with some of these problems we uh, face. Um, there's no question we're sharing uh, some of the same... We're sharing some of the uh, same issues and problems you guys have, but I want to just share some of our stats because from town to town, sometimes you don't always hear them. Uh, in 2019, as far as motor vehicle thefts, Manchester had 114. 2020, 174. And as of July 1st this year, we already have 101. Theft from motor vehicles. In 2019, we have 292. 2020, 468, and already as of July 1st this year, we have 273. Shots fired. In 2019, we had three. 2020, we had 13, and already as of July 1st this year, we have seven. <clears throat> I don't think any town right now is free of what's going on, any of these issues. I know I've spoken to a few representatives over the past uh, six months to a year. <clears throat> but what's concerning is not only the increase in crime, but the escalation of how these crimes are being committed. It's no longer just trying door handles. It's smashing windows. It's entering garages. Two Saturdays ago in, in Manchester, we had uh, a lady go out to her garage, was in, encountered by what they claim to be juveniles, they pointed a gun at her, it was a carjacking. The reason why I say that is because that's very traumatic. As an officer, 21 years of experience, I, like, like other people in our department, have been shot at. It's very traumatic. 
We train our officers in high-stress situations. We purposely do that to raise their heart rate, their blood pressure. So in the event that a uh, stressful situation occurs, they can make it through that, that they don't have auditory shutdown. I say that because your residents don't. That's very traumatic for a resident to see a gun pointed at them, to say, is this it? Is this the last time I'm gonna breathe a breath? You guys had a resident that was shot at. I can't imagine she's sleeping very well tonight. We have to take this into account when we're trying to come up with solutions. I don't have all the answers. I'll be the first one to tell you right now. <clears throat> Some of the things that we've encountered as officers, everybody who's been down Main Street in Manchester or has enjoyed the Manchester road race on Thanksgiving, you guys know that there's four lanes of traffic going down Manchester. One night we encountered, again, what was described to us as juveniles, so we know right off the bat that we can't chase them. Right? They were baiting our officer, coming back and forth, circling. 6 a.m. in the morning, they're going down Main Street southbound towards Glastonbury, <clears throat> going through all four lanes of traffic. All four lanes. Our officer saw this, can't engage, turned around and parked in a spot. At the same time, that car now is going in opposite direction of traffic, almost hit a car head on. <clears throat> I bring that up because what is that, if that's a citizen or a resident of Manchester, they almost lost their life that day. What are they also saying about the officer who they're paying taxes to protect them, who just parked in a parking spot? Now I'm saying we shouldn't be pursuing recklessly, there's no question. But there's some things that are occurring here that these juvenile suspects are aware of. They know we can't chase them. Some things have to change here. <clears throat> Now there's a, a debate, and I, and I understand it. I used to work in juvenile detention before I was an officer down in Bridgeport, so I get it. There's a lot of immature decision-making on the, on the part of these juveniles, I get it. <clears throat> but there's a debate between incarceration or programs. As officers, we have a responsibility to report to the citizens of the towns that we swore to protect. In order to be transparent, we provide constant data, stats, motor vehicle stops. Hey, Manchester made 1,500 motor vehicle stops, that's great. But we wanna know what time of day did you stop that vehicle? What was the race of the person you stopped? Ethnicity, did you search the vehicle? Why did you search the vehicle? Did you end it with a summons, verbal warning? Was it a, a uniform arrest? Was it a ticket? Tell us about that stop. We provide all those stats. Now, I recognize that the juvenile system is a protected system because they're juveniles, and I understand that. And I can appreciate that, they're kids. I'm not asking for their demographic information. I'm not asking for names where they live, but I think what we're asking for is a little bit of transparency on the programs that are out there right now. I think it was already said, what are the programs? Are they working, are they being utilized? If not, are we reassessing why they're not being utilized or why they're not working? Are the same offenders going through these programs more than once? <clears throat> I think those stats and those numbers should be provided not only to law enforcement, but to the public in general. <clears throat> now, I'll leave, you, I'll leave you all with this, because I, I know there's other speakers and, and they're just as important. I'm not, I'm not that important, all right? But I'll say this, all our police departments have a mission statement hanging in their department. I'm gonna read you a clip from ours. It's not the whole thing, but I think it has a lot of meaning here. <clears throat> we, the members of the Manchester Police Department, with the cooperation of our community, strive to improve the quality of life by upholding laws, protecting lives and property, and providing a safe and secure environment. <clears throat> I'd like to think that these principles still have meaning. And if I would not be doing my job as an administrator if I did, my, did not voice my officer's concern through me to you. There's a lot of frustration. 
with some of the restra restraints that have been put on us and the scrutiny that's put on officers while doing this job, uh, that they're not able to pro adequately provide that safe and secure environment, which I just read to you, to the same citizens they swore to protect. I'll leave you with that. Okay, Captain Sean Grant, <laughs> Mayor Lisa Morata, town of Rocky Hill. Mayor Lisa Morata, town of uh, Rocky Hill. Okay, followed by Deputy Mayor uh, and S Public Safety Chairman Ed Sheremut, town of Rocky Hill. And then followed by Town Councilman Jeffrey Levine, town of Rocky Hill. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and I, I really appreciate the invite to be here this evening. You know, for the past 16 months, I have been talking to everyone and anyone who will listen to our frustrations in Rocky Hill. You know, folks are scared, folks are angry, and they have every right to be. You know, as mayor of Rocky Hill, public safety is my top priority, but without the support of all of the state lawmakers, there's really not a lot that we can do anymore. And I wanna show and share with you exactly what we have been doing at the local level because we've been working very, very hard for the past 16 months. We instituted this three-prong approach because we recognize that it really is everyone's responsibility when it comes to creating safe communities. So our first approach is working with the state. We're reaching out to state lawmakers day and night. We're telling them what's going on. We're asking for their support. But we have seen sprees of car break-ins. We have had shots fired. We have had a woman held up, a carjacking at gunpoint, broad daylight, at a nail salon in a small strip mall. We have catalytic converter, converters that are now the, the big thing that kids are stealing. We saw bills drafted, but nothing really came out of committee and nothing was really passed that's going to give us the results that we desperately need. So let me tell you what I'm doing at the local level. We've been running Lock It or Lose It campaigns, and I even brought it to you. We send these home to every resident. We explain, hey, we'll help you set up neighborhood watches. And we do set up those neighborhood watches. I'm working closely with mayors from surrounding towns. We actually, we drafted this resolution to the governor. It's called a resolution regarding juvenile justice, escalating crime, and public safety. And I wanna read the last paragraph to you. It said that the Rocky Hill Town Council is unwilling to wait until someone gets hurt or a significant incident occurs before we seek accountability for the problems within the juvenile justice system that are creating havoc in our town. Because consequences isn't a dirty word and we shouldn't be afraid to use it. This was dated January 4th of this year and look where we are. <sighs> We have funded additional police officers at the expense of our taxpayers. I've worked with the mayor of Berlin. We did a two-day news uh, special series with Channel 3 to talk specifically about property crime. And mind you that our town is one of the few towns in the state of Connecticut where our police officers took it upon themselves to become nationally CALEA accredited, which is the gold standard of policing. I'm incredibly proud of them but their hands are tied. From a policing perspective, <laughs> from a policing perspective, I wanna tell you what we're doing. We use DNA swabbing, which is something very few police departments have trained officers to do. Our officers are actually able to go in and collect DNA from the vehicles as part of the investigations, which we can then send over to the state lab and those can be entered into the system for tracing. We've created a regional task force. We share and collect data. 
we hire, we actually have a detective that's embedded within the Hartford Police Department so that he can help solve crimes there and bring that information back to our town and surrounding towns. We use mobile license, license plate readers. We've established a tip line for residents who may feel insecure about calling when they see or maybe hear something. And finally, at the grassroots level, we are educating folks on what they should be doing, keeping their garage doors closed, taking the valuables out of the cars. But criminals are savvy, they're watching, they know that they're not going to be held accountable, and again, here we are. So we are doing our part in Rocky Hill. I am confident, Glastonbury, that you are doing yours, but we cannot rest until state lawmakers do theirs by finding and funding solutions. So I'm happy to be here to collaborate with you and to find those solutions together. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Ed Charmant from the town of Rocky Hill. Yes, uh, Ed Charmant, Deputy Mayor and Chair of our uh, Public Safety Committee. And I wanna thank you very much for this opportunity. It means a, an awful lot to Rocky Hill. So we are experiencing everything that, that we've heard so far in the room, as the mayor has told you. I can tell you that we don't think that our police force is the problem. Um, we, as the mayor said, we are uh, accredited by a national accreditation. Um, a statistic was thrown out to me that in Connecticut, in the Northeast, substantially, police departments are third party accredited. What we're seeing happen maybe in other regions of the country is because they, a large state like Minnesota has none accredited by third party administrators. In Connecticut, I believe we're somewhere around 30 police departments accredited by third party national accreditation. These are fine officers, men and women, doing their job. And now we're investing. We're investing a lot in them. Body cams, car cams, license plate reading, photography, Everybody has a ring camera. Everybody has uh, uh, cameras in their driveway. Now we're talking about putting up more cameras around streets or what have you. So everybody's investing in technology, but the problem is with a small few, which I've heard it said here already. It's the repeat offenders, and the legislative process or, and the judicial process is letting us down, in my opinion. <laughs> Uh, we want our state representative and our state senator to stand behind us, with us, and in front of us. And I just wanted to leave the resolution that the mayor and the council in Rocky Hill forwarded. We have the January 4th uh, resolution on, regarding juvenile justice. And we have our um, resolution of July 31st, 2020 regarding HB 6004, the act concerning police accountability. Our guys are reviewed. They're accountable. Next speaker is Jeffrey Levine, Town of Rocky Hill, Town Councilman. Hey, uh, good evening. Thanks for having me and uh, appreciate uh, you guys having the forum. Um, as you may have heard, Rocky Hill just had a similar one a few days ago, and we're hearing a lot of the same things tonight as we heard that night. Uh, so it seems to be a lot of commonality going on. Um, as was mentioned, uh, our police department is uh, equipped to do DNA testing, and one of the things they found was something I think somebody mentioned earlier that it's, it's not a tremendous amount of people doing these crimes. It's kind of the same group of people doing these crimes over and over again. And while they, the, what the, uh, they're seeing with the DNA is that they're not in the database, most likely because they're juveniles, but they're seeing the same DNA over and over and over again in these vehicles. You can take that for what it's worth. Um, we appreciate the work that, that the towns and the police departments are doing, not only individually, but collaboratively. Um, I know uh, our mayor mentioned uh, some of those areas and, um, the, the, the thing we have to keep in mind is that there's, it's a common issue we're all having. We hear the same thing from you guys. We hear from our surrounding, other surrounding towns. But what's the one common issue is that we're having issues at the state level because we all have to abide by the state laws. We can't change laws on the town level. We can't strengthen them. We just have to abide by them. It's up to our, our legislature, people at the legislature to do that. And quite frankly, we are at a point where we are frustrated 
at the lack of movement. We, you know, we keep hearing, we hear a lot of good speeches, and hopefully you guys can maybe spur this to go forward, but we like what you heard, but we hear a lot of that, yet what, where's the bottleneck? Everybody we talk to kind of says, yeah, we have to do something, we have to do something. Nothing happened in the last legislative session, so where's the bottleneck if everybody's saying we're supposed to move forward? I don't get it. And lastly, I'll just say we need to do something before the criminals continue to escalate into more uh, horrid acts and or a victim takes the law into their own hands because then it really gets serious. We can replace cars. We can replace things. We can't replace people. We don't want to get to that. We don't want to wait to get to that to make the law change. We want to do it before that point. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Loretta Rivers, Mark Anderson, Robert Clark. You're the next three speakers. Loretta Rivers, Mark Anderson, Robert Clark. At this point, please try and keep your remarks to two to three minutes. You're gonna hear a little bell. Okay. <laughs> At the end? And, and, and then I'll say, would you please wrap up? But okay. we don't wanna get there. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Loretta Rivers, and I live in Glastonbury in an apartment complex within a mile of the woman that was shot at. And the night before she was shot at, my next door neighbor had her catalytic converter stolen. And two weeks before that, I had my new used car vandalized, and we both park in a darker area. We think with my car, the people who've looked at it thinks that it was probably someone trying to get in the two front windows and maybe in through the trunk. So they think maybe my car was a target to be stolen and when they couldn't get in and steal it, they were probably disrupted because we were parked near the entrance that they simply scratched it. So I have about 1000 to $1,200 worth of damage to fix. And my, my, unfortunately, my next door neighbor, it cost her about 700 because her car is much older than mine. So one of the things I would like to see, we don't know who is responsible for this, but in talking with other neighbors, we found out a neighbor of ours in the same complex had his car stolen several months before. So one of the things that is helpful is um, these community watch groups we really need in apartment complexes and condo complexes. When management learns of these things, they should notify tenants so we all watch out for each other. And in our case, we could use more, so we could use surveillance cameras, that would help greatly, and better lighting. So that's all I have to say. Thank so you. Did it before the bell. Mark, you're next, followed by Robert Clark, followed by Janet. You live at the soap factory, Janet. Hmm. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mark Anderson. Uh, my wife and I are 18 year residents of uh, Glastonbury. Uh, walking up to the podium just now, I just passed four seats in the front row that have uh, memorial seats for people that have been killed by juvenile crime. Uh, it's my intention to make sure my name is not on that seat next year if we have this meeting. Um, to that end, both my wife and I are recent pistol permit applicants. Um, when you don't feel safe and you don't feel protected, uh, you will do what you need to do to protect yourself. I'll protect my family, my property, and, and myself. Um, unfortunately, these juvenile crimes uh, are in fact not kids doing uh, immature decisions, poor judgment. These are kids that are in training to become hardened long-term career criminals. I was, a, I was a teenager, I made some dumb mistakes, I made some bad decisions, never was it close to stealing a car, breaking in, had, holding a gun to somebody or any of that. That's not what we're talking about here. Um, so, uh, you know, unt until and unless, I mean, there's a Glastonbury Facebook page where uh, the community is constantly updating where people have uh, noticed more crime. I've, I've commented on that page saying these, this will not stop until and unless the lawmakers, the politicians that, that do not believe enough, and maybe you three do, but as a whole, obviously we don't in this state until they're voted out of, out of office. This is not going to stop. Well, thank you. 
Yeah, and, and just and, 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 on, and for the police, I, I know in this town, unfortunately, I don't have the uh, option to, to decide where my tax dollars go. If I did, I don't have kids in school, 100% of it would go to the police. Police today, <laughs> they're, they're, they're scrutinized, they're harangued, they're intimidated, they're held liable. Why on earth would somebody want to become a police? We need to support the police, we need to support the rule of law. Robert Clark, followed by Janet Zork, followed by Lori Andriot. Good evening. Uh, Robert Clark, Cider Mill Road in town here. I want to thank the town council for this event and organizing it, uh, and the dignitaries that are also here. And especially I want to thank all the law enforcement people that are here in this building and outside and in and around, continually protecting us um, but I asked the question, why are we here? It's not rhetorical. Why are we here? We asked for this last November and the November before that and the November before that when we voted in politicians who are weak on crime. Here we are. I'm not a genius, but I saw this coming. I think most of you did. And it's time to start voting with our heads, not by the par uh, political affiliation that you're associated with. It's time to stop voting people in who are weak on crime. And I don't care what party it is. I see signs here. We demand action now. New laws now. That ship has sailed. This is a, this is a, a prime example of trying to close the barn door after the, house, uh, the horse left. That horse is gone. That ship has sailed. These laws have been changed by the people you voted in. So come November, think about that. All right? I don't care what party you're, you're affiliated with. We talk about adjudication and, 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 and programs for these children who are basically juvenile delinquents and career criminals, but they're children, as, 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 as identified by politicians who are weak on crime. The police, their hands are tied. You probably have people in your family that are law enforcement people like, uh, with law enforcement like I do. They're just <laughs> unbelievably depressed. The rules of engagement have been changed. The laws of pursuit have been changed and weakened by people, by politicians who are weak on crime. It's not their fault. God bless them. I, you folks are angels, and I really appreciate what you do. <laughs> Nothing's going to change tonight. I mean, it's all cool. We're here. Feel good. Yeah, no, no, it's great. Thank you, and, and thank you for all coming. But start voting with your head. Janet Zork, followed by Lori Andrea, followed by Fran Carino. Janet? Just bear with me, I'm not used to talking to the public like this, uh, other speaker, but I am just overwhelmed what I'm hearing today. I had no, I know I read the papers every day, the Glastonbury citizens, but I had no idea it was this bad. And I cannot believe that Marlboro, how come they don't have a police station? I thought every town had a police station. <laughs> no? That's how naive I am, I'm sorry. <laughs> But the reason I came tonight is to support our Glastonbury Police Department. I think they're doing a terrific job, and not only Glastonbury, but all the other towns. I don't know why, I mean, I can imagine, no I can't. I don't think they know what's gonna happen from minute to minute. Who's going to pull a gun on him? I, 
I just have so much respect for you guys. I really do. That's all I had to say. <laughs> Lori, followed by Fran Carina, or Carino, followed by Dennis O'Connor. All right, can you hear me now? I'm Lori Andrada. I've li been living in Glastonbury for the last 18 years. We raised our children here, our three children. Um, I'm here because I b agree with you that there's a problem. And I believe that measures should be put in place to address this social problem we have in our state, including I think we should have a committee to investigate the factors leading to these crimes. I think we should have measures that treat these juveniles as the youth that they are yet enable state and town systems to intervene, fixing and building our restorative justice system, mental health system, DCF, parental support, the agencies who are here, as well as community support system. I also believe that it's important to protect our youth rights to remain in the juvenile system. First, I'm concerned that these crimes are being committed by juveniles. And I believe that it's an urgent matter for all our area and the state to remediate these issues that have caused this increase. There's a reason why they're doing it. Children don't just wake up and think, hey, I'm gonna be a criminal for my life. As a teacher in the West Hartford public school system, I'm not speaking for that system, but as a professional trained to do the work that I do, as a parent and as a believer in a faith, my local faith community, I know that these are people, they are youth. Why are they committing these crimes and what do they need? How can we help them? I'm asking for this committee with representatives of all sectors to investigate this issue. Please consider how complex the issue might be. Examine the intersectionality of the different factors. You know, we hear them often, poverty, race. I'm so disappointed to see how few people of black, indigenous, and other people of color we have here tonight. And I hope that the people who have come do feel welcome. Please consider this and consider the conception. Is it, is it motivated by gangs? Is it motivated by drugs? Is it systemic failure? These are our children. They are children. What changes need to be made in our local and statewide systems? What changes in agencies? I know DCF is completely overwhelmed. What do they need? Town systems like our police department. I love to hear that Rocky Hill has the accountability checks because those are important. We don't want to like, be known for people who are um, black, indigenous, and people of color being hurt by our police. They have to have systems in place. So it takes, it's going to take our whole community. It's going to take youth and family services. It's going to take the teen center. It's going to take education in our schools. We need local professionals like social workers, mental health providers. We need parents, local organizations, faith communities, and any other groups that are connected to these children. Please put in place measures to help our local and state systems as well, to help them fix our restorative justice system. That would include bringing together a committee to see what the issue really is. How we we do happen. need to ask you to wrap up, please. It would also... With this issue of it being repeat offense, we need to think of both the victims and the offenders. We need to put some things in place so that our police can do some work, but also, you know, think of the rights of the victims, I mean, the offenders as well. Okay, so Fran. if, Fran. excuse me. Excuse me, uh, hold on here. We've been excuse very me. civil. We're going to continue that. Fran, your time is up. Okay. This is where we need to be civil and Fran, listen. Fran, your because time is up. Because there's two people. These are measures I think you would like. It's important for us to learn to listen. Fran, please. If I would like to speak. Please. 
upon two arresting minutes, your time is up. Upon arresting a juvenile for car theft. Please, for those in the audience, you're not helping things, you're encouraging. Please. Would you please, re thank you. Please. Enough. Pardon? Enough. You enough. are saying enough? Enough. And you feel that the interruptions didn't take up my time? Honestly. Honestly, I think you would like to hear what I have. I believe that my time was taken. Wait. For the record, I believe part of my time has been taken by not following civil rules. I will leave to follow them. Please, 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 please. Focus here, okay? Don't turn this into a circus, all right? Dennis O'Connor. Hi. My name's Fran Carino. Oh, I'm sorry, Fran. <laughs> I'll try to do this in two minutes. I, I served as a prosecutor in the juvenile justice system for 41 years until I retired in January of this year. In 1979, I was the first full-time juvenile prosecutor appointed in Connecticut and served as the chief juvenile prosecutor for 17 years. In 1996, we merged into the Division of Criminal Justice uh, where the adult prosecutors are, and since then, we've acted as a, as a single unit within that organization. The things that I learned primarily in those 41 years about kids is that not every kid that comes through the juvenile justice system is a bad kid. In fact, the vast majority of them are good kids that do stupid things, like we all did when we were growing up. But there's a group that I would say maybe 10%, maybe 15%, hardcore, serious repeat offenders. Those are the kids I need to be concerned about. Because those are the kids that are causing the most crimes, the most serious crimes, the highest amount of property and personal injury and death. Those are the kids we need to concentrate on. Let's not revise the entire juvenile justice system and take away what the other kids, the 90% of the kids need to attack these 10%, but we need to address that 10%. I've presented at forums like this, but it takes about two hours to go through what the system is like now and what the changes need to be made and whatnot, so I can't really do it in two minutes. But I've presented such issues in Hebron, in Wethersfield, and in Newington, and, and this is over the last few years. This is not a new problem, it's just it seems to be spreading. Uh, but I, in the two minutes that I have, I, I'll mention two of the many changes that have occurred as a result of our legislature in the last 10 years. One involves, that was mentioned before, pretrial detention. The police used to be able to arrest the kid, write up a report that established probable cause, bring him to one of four detention centers, put him there, and then the judge would see the case the next day and decide whether or not the kid needed to stay locked up or could be released. Over time, that changed. Detention centers got full. The law was changed so that if you wanted to put a kid in detention for a non-serious offense, then you need to get a judge's permission. So the police would go to a judge, wake him up at night if necessary, get an order to put that kid in detention for non-serious offenses. And then it was determined that, boy, that really cut down intake on detention. So the advocacy groups and the liberals and the progressives who said, oh, detention is bad for kids. It's dramatic. They want to get rid of it, so what they said is, let's require a court order for any admission to detention, regardless of the seriousness of the charge. So if the police arrest the kid for a double homicide, they have to go to the judge's house and say, can I put this kid in detention? I think the judge will say yes, but they still have to go through that process. And then, to make matters worse, once they determine that, well, we've made it as hard as possible for the police to put kids in detention by making them jump through all these hoops, let's take a look at that judge's order and they took away three of the six grounds that that judge could find to justify putting a kid in detention. So that reduced the numbers even more. And so that's, again, detention is not the answer, but we talk about consequences, that's an immediate consequence. 
If the police chase a kid in a stolen car, catch him, they can put him in detention. That's an immediate consequence. I will tell you this, however. You can ask the kids, and the police in the room know this, you can ask the kids on their way to detention what's going on in their mind, and their attitude is, hey, nothing's going to happen. I'm a juvenile. I know I'm going to be let out, and detention's not that bad. My buddies are there now. We can sit and watch movies and, and, and be fed, and it's a, for a lot of these kids, it's actually a step up. So I think we need to revise our detention procedures. Please, please wrap up. Thank the you. other thing I want to point out to you is the sentencing procedure. There was a time, it sounds like a, was that my bell? <laughs> wrap it up. You've, you've got 30 seconds. Just wrap up, please. It sounds like a fairy tale, but once upon a time, if a kid was convicted of a wink one act, now we have to say adjudicated. We can't say convicted anymore. That's too harsh. But if, we put, if a kid was convicted of a, of a crime, the option that the judge had, among other things, the most serious option he has was to put a kid in a DCF facility, secure facility, for up to 18 months. And if at the end of that 18 months, DCF convinced the judge that we need more time to work with this kid, the judge could extend that commitment to another 18 months for a total of 36 months for low-level offenses. For serious offenses, it was 48 months. Well, the legislature recently changed that. So now we don't commit kids to DCF anymore. We close the juvenile, justice, uh, the juvenile training center, the only secure facility we had for kids. That's closed now. They've come up with other alternatives, but not quite as good as CJTS, as far as I'm concerned. But the amount of time you now get put on probation with or without placement in one of these facilities for up to 18 months. And if you need more time after that, you get another 12 months for a total of 30 months now, not 36 for minor offenses, and it's the same for serious offenses. We need to wrap it up. Okay, so if a kid goes out and kills somebody, does get transferred to the adult court, you're looking at 30 months maximum for that kid. So. Okay, thank you, Fran. <laughs> Dennis? Good evening. My name is uh, Dennis O'Connor, and I am a retired police officer, and I had the distinction to have Fran um, talk to us in the academy class, and he was a knowledgeable, Mr. Carino, enjoy your retirement. Thank you. I saw you through many classes. You were a wonderful speaker. He knows everything about juvenile law. I hopefully you guys can reach out to him down the road. Go. <laughs> My big thing, when I saw in the news, um, the poor innocent jogger in New Britain gets struck. I have seen dead bodies left and right, but that was so traumatic that I saw him get hit that day. And then the juvenile who had 11 or 13 priors just take out of the car, run, and the other guy follow right behind him. Why was he even out? That is my question to you, all you senators, and every politician. He should not be out. No way. The system is flawed for the juveniles. All right? It's time to take the kid gloves off, and we need to go to bat with the politicians coming to the floor. My other question is in regards to the town manager and the town of Glastonbury. Why is there no LPRs, license plate readers? I heard them talk about it earlier. I want to make sure that Glastonbury gets them. The officers get them. They can set up in strategic points on Hebron Avenue, Main Street. Any vehicle that goes by, it's going to have a record of it. It can be used to solve crimes further down the road the next day when the car comes in is stolen or anything else. I made a call today to find out. They're not, they were not budgeted. They're not even looked at. For the town of Glastonbury, which I reside in, I want to see license plate readers. I want these officers out in key spots, especially at night. Um, I had a saying at night, if there's anything out at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, it was up to no good or the person was going to work. Um, another thing... <laughs> The people of Glastonbury need to be notified when stuff like this is happening. It seems that a lot of this information does not get out to us. How come there's no reverse 911 call, especially this poor lady on Talkett Street that got shot at? Nothing's put out. The daily blotter that is on the website, the police website, I've been monitoring it every day. It is not updated. I want to see why 
and you can reach me and find out why the blotter is not being up, updated. Everyone that's arrested should be put in that blotter so the citizens of Glastonbury can go on the website from their home and see who Johnny got arrested two streets over and keep an eye on things. My last thing is the politicians, they defunded the police, they taken it and tied their hands. It's time for changes. I know they're trying to update the policies in regards to it, but the politicians need to be held accountable and this is where your vote will count. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. We're now gonna take a break and read some questions and see if we can get some answers to them. Uh, Richard and uh, Chief Porter, I think this one is uh, probably for you. At the last town council meeting, Chief Porter said we did not need additional police officers. Could you please explain why additional police presence would not be a deterrent? Sure. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. So I, I don't recall making that exact statement. I, I will say that the issue of staffing has come up, and I think it's, it's obvious that the more police officers we have on the street, the more likely it is we are able to prevent or intercept so, some of these crimes from happening. But I, but I, I will say um, to what end, uh, I think our money is better spent adding staff into specialized units. For instance, we have an auto theft task force that we started. I did have to uh, take officers from other units and patrol to staff that task force. That's a more, uh, I think, a more uh, efficient use of our resources. So I, I think when you start talking about adding one or two officers on the street on any given shift, as the town manager said before, we, we're a 52 plus square mile town. We have um, 460 or 70 some odd roads in town, a couple hundred plus miles of, of roads. And one of the things that we're dealing with now and one of the things that makes this very challenging for us is the, the days where these juveniles are afraid of the police, afraid of getting caught by the police are long gone. You've heard us talk about the, the shooting, the recent shooting. I will tell you uh, that six, seven minutes later, those juveniles were in another neighborhood doing the same thing. Uh, it's hard to believe that you just get involved in a shooting, you wouldn't beat feet and head on the highway and get out of town because you're afraid of getting caught. But they're not afraid of getting caught. Um, our officers who deal with these juveniles when we do catch them will tell you that um, they're, they're in it for the glory, they're in it for the, the thrill, they're in it for the, the, uh, the chase. They're materialistic and they seem to be unconcerned. There seems to be a lack of concern over their own safety and the safety of, of their victims. And so naturally, the more police officers we have, the more area we can cover and, and, and the greater our chances are. But again, I think our resources are best spent not continually increasing our patrol staff, uh, but putting people in specialized units so we can address the issue directly as we're doing with our task force. I, I, I will say this a little off topic. My favorite risk manager, I have a favorite risk manager, says predictable is preventable. I will tell you that the police chiefs have been warning about this for years with all the changes that have taken place. We have been warning about this for years and predicting it for years, and it's coming to fruition. So what I would ask, in addition to some of the things you've heard uh, the Manchester officer ask, is that when these decisions are being made in the legislature, talk to the people who know what they're talking about. Come to the police, listen to them. We've been accused of being anecdotal for years in our predictions, um, but we knew this was going to happen, and it's happening. So again, my ask is include us in the conversation and take us seriously. Our officers are on the ground. They see what's happening. 
they know what's happening. We keep seeing statistics after statistics. The statistics that you're seeing in the media, those red maps, that, those came from us. We provided that data. We know that over the years, there's been a statistically significant increase in motor vehicle thefts and thefts from motor vehicles in certain communities. Um, and, and you could follow the track right up the corridor. And Glastonbury is one of those communities. So those statistics came from us. We know that it's been happening. Um, we know because of the low solvability rate of any property crimes, and, and these stolen vehicles are property crimes, because of the low solvability rate, it's difficult for us to come up with the data to prove our point. What I will tell you is the data is out there, and you also heard this talked about tonight. One of our asks is that we have access to the data statewide. Our officers need it to make good decisions. Our judges need it to make good decisions, and it's just not readily available right now. So, thank you. Talk radio spoke of a juvenile felony act in the works. Uh, would somebody please like to comment on that? Is there actually a juvenile felony act in the works? Okay, the answer to that is, to the best of our knowledge, talk radio is wrong. Um, all right, uh, we're going to move back to some speakers. I'm going to start with the council. As this is a council meeting, I'll begin with Mr. Nyland. If you want, you can do it right there. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. I'm hoping that all of us together can make a difference in what's been happening here and everywhere else. Uh, I, you know, to our legislators and everyone else, I get that putting 16 and 17 year olds in jail is problematic. We changed the age on youthful offenders. But for the most part, we haven't done anything. In to, it, we put nothing in place to go along with changing the age that keeps these very same kids out of trouble. We, we changed the game, and we invested nothing, we've spent nothing, and these kids just go out and they commit more crimes. There are no consequences. The only difference between right now and before we change the age is right now, more and more innocent people are getting hurt or they're gonna get hurt, and we can't let that continue to happen. So instead of just complaining to our state legislators and our great guests that we have here. Um, I'm going to offer a couple of solutions of my own. A couple have been brought up by a couple of people here. Um, just so you know, my background, I've worked for over 30 years with the police department. My assistant chief is here tonight. Thank you for coming. And um, I'm not an officer, but I've watched what's been happening. Um, one of the first things I think that we have to do is we have to stop thinking of stolen motor vehicles as just property crimes. Cars are being stolen. They're not for joy rides. These kids are going out and they're committing other crimes and the police cannot chase them. It's a property crime. Police have to wave goodbye and watch the car go away. We have to, have to, have to review our police pursuit properties and at the very least allow the police to use stop sticks again so they can stop these kids who are taken off and crashing into people and causing horrific accidents like the one we saw in Glastonbury. And we've seen all, all these other problems. Two days ago in West Hartford, we had a two-year-old stolen in the back of a car. Thankfully, that was considered a higher level of crime, and we were able to use stop sticks to, to grab that car. It's not just a property crime. We also need to bring back the youthful off offender policies that we used to have, where 16 and 17-year-olds are not charged as adult, but they could be held, and we should be able to hold them longer. Instead of six hours, when our officers are going out and before the end of their shift, some of these kids are back on the road. We need to spend, extend the time that they can be held beyond the six hours, and we need some type of progressive discipline that allows for extended times for our repeat offenders. Another thing that I think we have to do is we have to take in, start granting take into custody orders for, from our judicial department. We can't have our officers chasing the same kids during the same shift because they're out the door again. Our officers are going out, they, can't even, they don't even bother writing up, um, taking the custody orders anymore because they've been turned down over the years. 
And it's time that we all give our police departments the ability to do that again. Additionally, there's other programs and other models out there that include grant money that helps parents learn the necessary skills that provide individual accountability and expertise in working with home problems like oppositional defiance disorder. We need to get back to those and give the parents the tools that they need to deal with their children. And lastly, I think we need to push all our departments on a Connecticut information sharing system, which is a, a, pro, a, a sh information sharing system that goes available to all the police departments, and it has to include the sharing of juvenile information. I, I, listen, I know we are never going to stop all the crime. We're never going to stop every single kid from committing a crime. We're always going to need our police department. But right now, we have to do all that we can to mitigate the problems we have. Glastonbury is, is a strong community, like so many other communities throughout the state. And we should not live in fear. And we will not live in fear. But Governor Lamont, our legislators, the Judicial Department, everyone, regardless of your party, we need your help. It's time for you to act, so please give us the help we need. Thank you. I'm a veterinarian, not a lawyer, um, not a juvenile criminal person. But my fear is that there will be dead people by Labor Day in some town, aside from a jogger. I think these guys that pull guns in your house, it's not far to walk into your bedroom for jewelry or anything else. And if they're gonna pull out a gun, whether they shoot you or whether you have your pistol permit and shoot them, I don't think dead bodies is gonna be what we wanna see. I hope the legislative leadership considers that along with the judicial department when they talk about their second chance because I think second chance is great for a cherry bomb in somebody's front yard, a graffiti, a smash mailbox with a baseball bat, but I think stealing cars, going into people's houses, and pulling guns is far, far beyond what any of us thought was juvenile crime. <laughs> and I think for this small group of very um, dangerous people, if they're gonna be physically threatening and assaulting people with antisocial behavior, they need to be removed from society. That doesn't mean throw away the key for 50 years. It might be a day, a week, a month. It might be a CCC camp so you can get the social workers to find out what their issues are, but they need to be removed from society so they can't continue to terrorize other people. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to try it from here, Larry. Is, okay. uh, Kurt Cavanaugh, thank you all for coming out this evening. I really appreciate your uh, participation in this. It affects all of us, even those of us that are elected officials. I just want to comment on some of the things I heard from our invited guests tonight. I tried to find a quote from uh, Ronald Reagan in the 80s when he said, um, we can't blame society on the ills that are uh, coming to our to our towns, and I I heard that about this being a societal issue tonight, and I think it's a breakdown of the nuclear family. There, people have to be stronger at home to teach their kids how to behave in public, and I think that you know when I was a kid growing up, if I did something. Out of the ordinary, I'd get a, uh, a, a either, a, well, you know what I would get. Um, please, please. Yeah. We're, we're going to be respectful this evening. If you'd sign up, you can have your two minutes to say your piece. But let's give Mr. Kavanaugh his opportunity to say his piece. Please. Um, someone else mentioned that uh, people need to come together, and I think it's the legislature that needs to come together. Um, having to live with don't turn your lights on at night, having to close your garage door when you cut your lawn in the back, it's no way to live. Um, the Second Chance Society.
that like everything that this legislature has done over the last 30 years, this second chance society legislation has unintended consequences and we're witnessing them right now. Um, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask a couple questions of the, the panel or through the cards. Otherwise, that's going to encourage everybody to ask questions. So, Kurt, if, if I can get you a card. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, Deb Carroll, followed by uh, Jake, followed by Lillian. Hi there. Um, so we, we need the legislation. We need to include access to the juvenile database. We need to include a policy for pursuit. We need to give our law enforcement the tools to do their jobs. Um, we need a special session. This isn't, sorry, I, I could even just stand back and yell. I've been a high school teacher for 20 years. Happy to do it. So this isn't a partisan issue. You are hearing all of us agree with you. We are Democrats, we are Republicans, we are independents, and we are in this community. We know how you feel. I want to thank everyone for being here. This is how change happens. I especially want to thank Jill Berry. Her solutions-based approach is what we need. But if you're just shouting into the void without further support, without support further up the food chain, it's meaningless. We need to push for more. We need to push for more consequences. I am the mother of three boys, two of whom are teenagers. I am scared for them. Someone tried to take my car from my garage this fall. Luckily, it was my husband, not luckily, he wouldn't be happy to hear me say that. I'm, I'm relieved it was my husband who went out there and they left. God forbid it was my 15-year-old, my 13-year-old, or my nine-year-old. I do not want to see that happen. Um, you know, if some, very aware, if someone gets out of line in my house, there are consequences. And if you break the rules, you lose privileges. So for my children, who are talking to me about this today, seeing kids go free for stealing cars, stealing cars with children in them, shooting at other people, and knowing that in their own house that they're losing privileges for talking back to their parents, it's really hard for them to understand how these other juveniles are out essentially setting the world on fire and they don't know why. So we have an opportunity to lead here, this group, to push for changes, not just in our community of Glastonbury, but for our neighbors who are suburban, who are urban, who are in cities. We all need to push to make those changes and they have to happen at the state level. So keep pushing for a special session, keep pushing for very specific legislation. It has to happen or this will continue to happen and the conversation is going to be much darker. I forgot who's next. Jake, that's you, followed by Lillian, followed by Mary. I just want to start by saying uh, thank you so much to everyone who came out tonight. Um, and it was an even more packed uh, audience earlier in the evening, especially, most importantly, when the cameras were here. Um, I've tried to convince people to come out tonight to show uh, support uh, for this issue uh, that Glastonbury thinks this is a problem. I'm glad that we invited members of other towns to come out to, to be a part of the discussion. I think that that's how we're going to move this forward. Uh, so I, I have a two-year-old at home. We have another kid on the way. Uh, I'm very scared. Uh, I lie awake sometimes in the middle of the night wondering if the lights that have gone by are, are someone who's going to try to break into our home or our car. Uh, and I think that all of us up here feel uh, the way that we've heard members of our community express that they feel tonight as well. Um, but you, you wonder what can you do 
because I know I've felt as a town council member, I would have hoped that I had more of an impact I could have had on this issue, but as you've heard many times, this is a state level issue that we need to press for a response at the state level too. And I think that the way that we as members of this community can get action to happen is to do what we're doing tonight, come together as various communities and to express very clearly to our state legislature and to all of the parties involved that we need some type of action to happen. Um, and I, I think that that's happened tonight. And I, I would also stress, you've heard very clearly from your legislators, I know I've talked a lot with Jill about this issue, there are, there are things on the table that can be done even immediately at the governor's level to address this. So what we need to do as a community is not just to write to our legislators who get it, but to write to legislative leadership, to write to Governor Lamont, uh, to write to anyone else, other communities, to attend other communities' meetings, make comments like you've made here tonight at those other communities' meetings, to try to make it very clear this is a full Connecticut issue. And as we've heard tonight, this isn't suburbs, this isn't the cities. Uh, this is everyone who needs to come together to try to address this rising crime uh, that's very terrifying. Uh, I did want to make one comment. Uh, it was very nice to see Fran tonight. I'm very thankful for hearing your comments. It's nice to see you again. Um, I have some experience. I worked in my career as a prosecutor. Um, there has been some discussion of second chance society uh, and that issue. One thing I think that I've seen um, both in my time as a prosecutor and since, and in hearing uh, legislators' uh, opinions of the prosecution system, is unfortunately an undermining or a, a lessening of confidence in something called prosecutorial discretion. And I think that uh, what we need to understand is we can put faith in members of our judicial uh, process to make the decisions they need to make on a case-by-case -case basis uh, for a particular case in a uh, particular instance. Uh, so you may have a juvenile who needs to have some intervention in something because the things that have led them to commit what they've done uh, could have been addressed and, and they have a hope for a better future. But I think that what you've seen repeatedly tonight is that a lot of the people who are committing these crimes uh, in our communities are ones who are significant repeat offenders and those are the ones that our judicial process and our judicial system, the people involved in it, need the tools necessary to address that behavior. So hopefully you'll join me and you'll join everyone else up here in trying to press our legislators, not just in Glastonbury, but throughout the entire state uh, to address this issue and give those people the tools they need to address this problem. Thank you. Thank you. So tonight we've heard an extensive list of possible legislative solutions um, to the problems that we're facing in Glastonbury and throughout the state with crime that is escalating and putting our families in danger. This isn't just about cars, this isn't just about property, it isn't just about keeping mine to myself, it isn't just about walling off our suburbs, you know, from the big bad cities. This is a real problem of crime that impacts all of us across all towns. Um, to that end, I'm not going to go through the list that my colleagues have already stated of what our legislature should be doing, the policy action that you're taking. I think we all have a much better understanding tonight of that now. Um, but I do want to point out a few thoughts I have listening to this as a resident, as a mother in town, as someone who has myself been a victim of crime in Glastonbury. Um, and the first of those is um, that we do not need to chase this crime out past our borders. We don't need to lock down Glastonbury and just wait till this goes somewhere else. Our state needs real comprehensive reforms to address a real problem for every citizen, just point blank. Additionally, we've heard a lot of talk about you know, efforts that are nonpartisan, bipartisan, Absolutely true. In this room, this is a nonpartisan concern, and that is wonderful. But one thing we're not telling ourselves the truth about is what is the stone wall that our legislators are hitting in Hartford? 
And that is a partisan problem. Um, and so I would call on our legislators who are clearly well-versed in all of these solutions to speak to their leadership and tell their leadership that if they don't do something about this problem, that our towns are not going to stand for it. And they will not be in leadership soon enough. And I hope they take that action, even if that's not my party. I hope they take that action. Um, and I hope that they get their feathers for it and their flowers for it, too. Um, you know, here in town, we have been searching for stopgap measures, searching for scotch tape, because all of us here on town council, everyone serving our town, our police department, very clearly our town manager, we know that we cannot afford for these crimes to escalate any further. Um, so we are looking for additional investments. We're looking for additional feedback from members of the town in areas where we can communicate with town residents more about how to keep themselves safe, in areas that we can work with residents um, to monitor the situation in our town. Um, we are fully committed to providing every resource, and I think I can speak for all of us, every resource our police department needs that can effectively um, help them in, in their mission to keep us all safe. And, uh, and we are committed to using our voices as representatives of our town to speak to our legislators. I know that sounds kind of pathetic. It drives me crazy that that's what we've got on our end to deal with, to use. But those are our tools. We're committed to them. Um, and then beyond that, very much our state leadership you need to address this problem or you will be held accountable. Apparently I forgot to raise my hand at the beginning, so I, I get to go last, I think. Um, so as Lillian said, like this is, as far as town council is concerned, this is not a partisan issue. Every single one of us is with you. Um, I really want to thank Safe Street CT um, for bringing this and putting the pressure on. Thank you. And we need to keep it on. Um, I grew up in a small town in New York State. It's called Boston, New York. I'm sure nobody's ever heard of it. <laughs> Ooh, Buffalo. Um, we didn't lock our doors. We didn't lock our house. We waved at everybody when a car went by because you knew everybody. And Glastonbury felt very much like that when I moved here. And it doesn't now. Something at the state level needs to change. We need new laws. I've heard people saying, well, this isn't really a, a Connecticut thing. Um, car thefts have gone up across the whole US. They've only gone up by 9% across the US. They've gone up 40% in Connecticut. So like, I don't buy into that. There are things that need to change. Um, and we need to call a special session so that something can happen. I specifically want to thank our officers. They're at the front lines of this. And I can't imagine doing that job. I had a friend in Glastonbury um, who had someone in his yard um, overnight. Uh, he called our police department and they were there within one minute. I had a friend in Manchester, I wish, I don't know if the Manchester police are still here, um, who had her daughter and grandson visiting. Um, and they were, it was middle of the day. They had a garage door open. They were playing between the front and backyard. Um, and someone went into the garage, stole her daughter's um, wallet and her grandson's backpack. Then went down the street, and I think that was the one where, that they talked about where someone was held up in, in their garage. Luckily, she was able to have her stuff recovered because she had a tile uh, within her wallet. And the police in Manchester worked with the police in Hartford to track that down. Um, they went to the first house that the wallet went to, and they found one stolen car there, a bunch of stolen property, uh, the wallet was no longer there. They checked where did the tile say that it was, uh, went to that address, found two more stolen ve vehicles and a bunch of stolen property. And luckily that wallet. Um, 
I just want to close with one statement. Instead of handcuffing our police, we need to allow the police to handcuff the people who are doing this. I've been told on that talk radio juvenile felony act, it's in the works in New York State. Um, okay, additional speakers. Uh, Dr. Jackson, uh, Tom Callahan, Julie Reed. Hi, I'm Sage Jackson. Uh, I live in uh, Woodbridge Road in Glastonbury. And a few of you heard this at the town meeting, but I just want to emphasize for the people, since there's a lot more people here, um, my house is d diagonally across from the house on Talcott. It could have been my house that the, the bullets went into, um, and it terrified me, okay? I'm not a very scary per scared person, okay? You come in my yard, I'll come right out and give them your, where I grew up was Brooklyn. We didn't take that crap, <laughs> okay? But I love living in Glastonbury. I've been here 20 years, and I don't want to have to think about not being in Glastonbury. Um, one of the things that uh, Senator Cassano said I totally agree with, uh, and that is there are adults behind these crimes as well. Um, these children, youth, young people, whatever you want to call them, are not doing this on their own. And I know this because I, I know this from my work and I know this from personal experiences that there are people that provide housing and food and other things that young people who don't have this need. And the way they get it is by doing things for the adults, like stealing cars and committing crimes. We need to get at the adults behind the crimes as well as uh, enforcing the whatever laws there are for children, which I don't know. I also want to add that, you know, we, we also need to look at things like prevention, which starts when the kids are very, very young and the schools are not, if they don't come to school, they don't come to school. Nobody goes after them. If we didn't show up, they were right at my parents' house. Now they're, they, oh well, they don't come to school. Um, and the parents don't do anything about it either. So we need to look at very young prevention as well um, as enforcing whatever laws we can as exist, and I do believe we need stronger laws as well. The only other thing I want to say is that I want to be sure that we take care that we don't use things like racial profiling to, to do our neighborhood watches. Our community is becoming more and more diverse, which it should be, and I don't want my family being profiled um, because somebody thinks they shouldn't be on this street. So I just want to make that as a little bit of a, a caveat, but I do think that neighbors should watch out for neighbors, and um, I, I also do believe that we should support police. I have police in my family, and um, they do an amazing job, and we can help them do that job. So I thank you for listening. Thank you. Tim. Julie Reed, then Chris Hoff. But, but uh, Tim, you're first. Oh, okay. Yeah. Tim, followed by the other Tom two. Before. That's my father, but that's All okay. Right. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, Tim Callahan, I live in town. Um, and I got to tell you, the reason I'm here is because it affected me. It personally affected me. It, it scared the bejesus out of me. Um, I was the guy with the five teenagers who did the uh, smash up derby in town. I was the first car on South Main Street. And it's a beautiful, pristine Sunday, idyllic uh, uh, Sunday afternoon. You know, I'm going to drive to see a friend, and, and, and uh, this BMW just hammered, I mean, just slammed into me. Um, and I pulled over, and then I, I think I saw after I saw some of the cruisers go by. Um, and, and that that really, you know, what I thought about that is uh, my daughter and my wife almost lost a husband or a dad, okay? So I'm putting a face to 
This isn't about somebody in a newspaper or nobody. This is, you know, this is serious stuff. In all due respect to all the representatives, the senators, and the board, I, you know, and I, I, I need to say this. I went to the uh, the town council meeting before, um, and I was and, and I was mad because I, it, with all due respect, I got from the town council. There's nothing we can do. You got to talk to Harper. You know, I got one of those. And then you know what I thought. Well, when, why do I? We have you guys. And, and all due respect, I think. Um, this group of folks and this group of folks need to work together um, and get the seriousness of this, all right? Because it's not only, uh, you know, I almost lost my life. It's about $7,000 worth of damage. And, and, and quite honestly, I feel like my rights are, in, you know, they don't matter. So, I mean, we're all human beings and we're all equal. So why, you know, we're dancing around that, well, and two of these guys are 18 years old. I, I don't know if that's a juvenile in the state of Connecticut or not. Okay, so, and one of them was, was let out, like, that night. Yeah, see, I mean, I mean, and this is, this is like I was in that game, um, you know, that crash-up game. So where I'm going with this is somebody almost lost their husband and their father. I think we should have equal rights, not why are we always stepping around everybody else but us. And we're the victims. Um, so, so I, and I know I have a little time, but um, what, I, I don't get the urgency from you folks. I really don't. No offense. I'm not getting the urgency. And the next time we have this town council meeting, somebody's going to be dead. And I hope I'm wrong. God, I hope I'm wrong. And you can tell I get a little emotional about this because this is, this is, this is scary stuff. So, um, you know, we talk about second chances. I get, I get about youth, youth offenders and that. But if they killed me, I didn't have a second chance. I was dead. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Julie? Followed by Chris Half, followed by Fran. Fran, you live in Weathersfield. Nikias, okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Julie Mascaro. Um, I'm a resident here in Glastonbury. I work with children. I work with parents, um, kids who just need direction. They need purpose in their life so that they don't commit these crimes. So when you're up there and you're writing your laws and you're signing off on bills, maybe pretend that that child is your child or your friend's child or your niece or your nephew and the person that they hurt is a relative or your sister or your brother and have it personal to you. When I work on cases, I treat the children as if they were my own child in the mindset of, if my kid did this, what would I do to help reform them? You can't have just one approach for these crimes. Depending on the child, you have to have a tailored approach. And I'm coming from the perspective of a child who doesn't have any parents living, who had a state-appointed guardian my grandfather, who was 70, who did not look after me the way that maybe he should have. But I wasn't trying to steal cars. I wasn't hurting anybody. Because within me, I knew I was meant for something great in this life, helping other people. Please, please don't clap, because it's not about me. It's about these children. We have to help them get some type of direction so that they make the right decisions. It starts from an early age. It starts from the age of one, two, three. The parents that I work with, they're coming to see us, okay, because they're not model citizens. You know, they're doing drugs, they're prostituting, they're stealing. You think their kid's not gonna learn that? And it's not a race problem, it's not a gender problem, it's an environmental problem, and we just have to help them. Lucky for me, I had teachers that helped me, 
I had neighbors that helped me. And now as an adult in this community, I'm very close with my neighbor who treats me like her daughter, helps take care of my kid, gives me advice. It's a nice community here. But we have to help the kids that we know have issues early on. If you've ever heard of the book, which maybe you haven't, probably haven't, it's called My Life. It's by Iceberg Slim. He was a pimp. He prostituted women. He had 30, 40 women at a time. He was in the 70s and 80s. He was a very, very high-profile person. If you read the book, if you read the first couple chapters of his childhood, it's horrible. Him and I had some similar experiences in our childhood. That's him. This is me. So as much as there are victims who are having their cars taken away from them, and that's horrible, and they could lose their life because somebody smashes into them, we have to help these kids with prevention, early prevention, let the punishment fit the crime, some type of juvenile hall where they have some type of reform where they're learning, um, gardening, cooking, electrical, uh, some type of program for them to help them be productive members of society. You need to wrap up. I'm sorry. Okay. Lastly, if you adopt a child in the state of Connecticut, they get free college because the state recognizes that they want productive members of the society. So something like that. Ankle bracelets is a nice idea, but having a kid locked in their house for months at a time isn't going to help their mind. We have to help their minds in some way. Julie, you need to wrap up. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Chris, followed by Fran, followed, followed by Rich Kohler. Fran Nikitas, Weathersfield. Um, okay, Chris was uh, before oh, you. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Chris? Oh, okay. okay. I'm sorry. All right. Um, Rich, you're on stage, or on whatever it is. Even yes. before the shooting in Glastonbury, before the jogger was killed, and before that horrific three crashes in, in Glastonbury, I have been contacting Governor Lamont and my state senators. I have received no responses. The unintended consequences of the raise the age law is to encourage repeat offenders Raise the age laws are inappropriate in dealing with repeat offenders. If the raise the age law remains, it should only apply to the first nonviolent offense. Subsequent offenders and violent offenders should be treated as adults. I cannot understand. I cannot understand. If I can teach my dog not to touch my other dog's chew toy, why a 12-year-old human cannot be taught right from wrong? And whether it is the failure of the parent to be able to teach the child right from wrong, or the, the child's inability to, or unwillingness to learn it, it becomes, we become the dragon fodder. Now, I believe it was Representative Barry you spoke about, I might be wrong, about the um, parole officer being on call. Okay, we live in a computer age. Why cannot every single of the 169 towns of this state have a centralized database? You key it in, in real time. So-and-so picked up for this charge, this age, blah, 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 and Everybody has access to it. Why is there secrecy shrouding these repeat offenders? I don't get it. I also don't understand <laughs> the futility of repeatedly arresting these criminals. They suffer no consequences. Meanwhile, our police officers expend effort, resources, and risk their personal safety to apprehend them, only to have them walk away. It makes no sense to squander our police resources with ineffective laws. Something has to change. I am so thankful to that New Britain police officer who got that 15-year-old with the um, high-capacity magazine and the assault rifle. 
which one of our communities was next to be in the headlines had that kid chosen to use that assault weapon? I, I don't get it. They, sometimes I've heard people say, the older you get, the less you understand. That's me. <laughs> Why are expectations for these kids so low? I don't get it. By the time you're 12 years old, if you don't know right from wrong, I don't know what's going to convince you. Fran, you need to wrap up. Okay. I don't take solace um, in the, the, the data that's talking about the decrease in car thefts. I don't, I don't buy it. To continue on the current path, we're going to have thugs, gangs in our society, and it doesn't make any sense to me. Thank you. If anybody Chris. sees my senators, please have them call me. Chris, you're next, followed by Rich, followed by Joanne Freeberg. So um, anybody who knows me or, or has seen me at the Board of Ed meetings, I have about a billion notes. Um, I am not, I'm going to keep this quick because I don't think I could say anything uh, additional that hasn't already be, been said and said very well. Um, I think with an audience like this, I, I, my, my knee-jerk instinct is to uh, give you a hard time about taxes. I think I'm going to skip that for right now, although <laughs> the, the, the mill rate, that was exceptionally horrible. Thanks for that. Uh, state level also, please do something about taxes. Uh, I think I'm just going to thank everyone. Um, I'm, a, um, I'm a Republican. Uh, Jill Berry is the only Democrat that I voted for. Uh, these are, her comments are the reason I, I did. So, uh, you know, I, I, lo I look for that kind of thing. I don't uh, vote down party lines um, if there's somebody saying something that, that uh, I agree with. Uh, I also appreciated the, the comments from the town council. Uh, I was impressed uh, by that, so thank you. Um, thanks to uh, Safe Streets, if it wasn't for you guys, I wouldn't know what was going on. I have no idea. These, these, this is my information right here. I, I don't get it from the state. I don't get it from the town. I get it from these people right here. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you guys, the police, obviously, you know, thank you. You, you, you're, you got a raw deal right now. So I, I, I hope that changes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Rich. Followed by Joanne, followed by, I believe it's Dale. Are we good? Can you hear me? Good. My name is Rich Kohler. I am the owner of Elite Karate. I've been empowering in this community for 26 years. That's what I do, okay? So I talk about empowering, and the hardest part was just trying to think about I didn't bring notes. I just go, okay? So let me just tell you, that's what I do. And one of the hardest things for me is to listen, I'm not very political or any of that, and I listen to all this stuff going on. I'm thinking about you guys. That's what I do. I'm the one that teaches the people that had the home invasion in town. I'm the one that has taught hundreds of women empowerment, a lot in Farmington, and sir, I wanna shake your hand, because a lot of it was about Farmington. Um, and I, I have a thing about, I, I work with Interval House. Never, I never charged a penny to train these women, hundreds of them. Everything went to interval house, abuse, domestic abuse. That's what I do. So I think what's missing sometimes that I see, I teach self-defense. I don't teach victim mentality. Victim mentality is self-oppression. So when you say, and with all respect, shut your light off and let someone steal your stuff. <laughs> it's hard, and I know I'm a self-defense guy. I will tell you, avoid. It makes sense, it's logical. Do not confront a physical, potentially violent situation. It is foolish. On the other hand, I witnessed one of these, one of the beginning ones. It was 8.30 in the morning. People were going to work, right in front of my house. I'm watching four of them get out of their car. Boom, 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 hitting all the cars. What do I do? That's bullshit to me. I don't, I don't teach people to curl up. I'm sorry, I just can't do it. I, I don't, te what, I teach kids that get bullied every day. How many of you have school-aged children that would tell your kid to go to school and say, hey, when a bully goes to take your lunch money, give it up just in case they might hurt you? It's not the money, 
it's the, the shame they feel of not sticking up for themselves. You can't beat that out of somebody. It's just going to happen. And what's going to happen is somebody is going to get hurt really bad. And, and I don't, it, it really blows me away because I've seen the escalation. This is what I analyze. And don't get me wrong, guys. Everything is learned behavior except falling and loud noises. When these kids are doing this stuff, they learn that, hey, I can do anything I want. I can hit, I can hit cops with bats. I see it on TV all the time and get away with it. This is learned. This isn't glass. This is, I hate to say it, this is the way we see a lot of our country right now. Okay? It's learned behavior. We have a saying in self-defense, why do you get attacked? You know why? Because they think they can do it. You don't see people going up to big jack guys and say, I'm going to go kick his butt. It doesn't happen. Why? Because it's not a soft target. These laws have made us soft targets. Okay? When was the last time, and this is not political by no means, but when was the last time there was a gunfight at a gun show? <laughs> there isn't. You get them at schools, you get them in movie theaters, you get them at concerts, everywhere where no one's allowed to carry. You and I'm not saying pro-gun or any of that stuff. I have one. I'm afraid to use it because I know if someone, I'm afraid that if someone breaks into my house, I have to wait for the bullet to whiz by my head because I don't want to go to jail. Thank you, you need to wrap up. All right, so I get the whole safety thing, shut off your lights and all that. I didn't. I ran out of my house. I ran after those bastards. Sorry. And they got in their car, and I was fortunate I did not get shot at. I couldn't help myself. I'm not a victim. Okay, thank and I you. hate to see everyone else be a victim. So something's got to be done. Joanne, are you here? Okay, moving to Dale. Oh, no, is that you, Joanne? Joanne Freeberg. All right. I believe it's Dale Ethner. James Stanley. Yes, I'm ready. You are? Dale Ethier. I'm a resident okay. of Glastonbury. Uh, I wanted to come here tonight to this meeting uh, just because um, a few weeks, what, a month ago now, uh, just witnessing that uh, accident on. Uh, uh, Route 17 uh, with the uh, stolen vehicle uh, hitting the gentleman. And, uh, you know, I just want the uh, lawmakers to realize that what if that was your, what if was that with your uh, husband, daughter? Okay, that's all of you on that board. Okay, and what troubles me here is with probably a lot of the degrees that are sitting at this table, everybody's like, oh, what's going on? Maybe there needs to be some repercussions for actions. Have you not figured that out yet? You have to have committees and this and that. You know why people are here? Because they're the first to be taxed and the last to be considered. That's why they're here. Okay? Do you understand that? Do you understand that? I emailed each and every one of your offices and none of you got back to me. None of you did. How unprofessional. What are you running up there at that LOB building? What kind of offices are you running? Never mind other people, you. You, you, and you. So let's start working a little professionalism. Let's start looking out. I would like you people to ask a question to yourself when you get ready tomorrow. Look in the mirror, say, who am I? What am I? Where am I going? And am I leading the state of Connecticut in the right direction? Is that a fair few questions to ask yourself? <laughs> Who am I? What am I? Where am I going? And am I leading this state in the right direction? That's all I have to say. Oh, one more thing. And Mr. Galata, to your math at the beginning of the meeting, we're here because of a few bad apples. I think you've heard quite a few numbers tonight, and it's more than a few. Thank you, Dale. James Stanley, Christine. Christine Brabo, Triumph Street. I'm not sure no, 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 no. <laughs> oh, next, okay. Yeah, James, you're up. All right, I'm James Stanley. I live on Sherman Road. I was sleeping about 
200 feet from where the shots rang out on, on Talcott. So this is kind of close to home to me as well. You opened the meeting tonight stating that tonight was about we, not you. Well, we, the people of Glastonbury, East Hartford, Portland, Manchester, and other surrounding towns elected you. It's your responsibility to represent us to the state. It's your responsibility to represent us as individuals. It's not right for parents to have to worry about their kids being carjacked in their own driveways or being shot at in their own yards. Connecticut legislature and the governor are more interested in passing bills to legalize marijuana and online gambling than they are addressing the crime that is riddling our state. As a result of car thefts, residents have been shot at, residents have been involved in car wrecks, and a New Britain man was killed while jogging. This is unacceptable. We can address later why this is happening. We need to take action to stop it from happening now. This is a question for you, the town council, the state legislature, and Governor Lamont. Are you prepared to accept the consequences of citizens being pushed far enough to start defending themselves if you fail to take action? The police officers who protect us, we thank you for what you do. We stand with you. We understand that it is the government that has tied your hands. Thank you. Christine, followed by um, John Perello, and followed by LaShawn Robinson. Hello, thank you for coming out, um, everyone, tonight. So I started Safe, Street, Safe Streets Glastonbury, which is growing, hopefully, to Safe Streets CT. And <laughs> thank you. Um, so the first thing I want to say to everyone is please send me an email at safestreetsglastonbury at gmail.com um, to get your name added to the list, because we need to grow our group. Um, we need more volunteers, we need to better organize, and to do that we need all of you, anyone listening at home or anyone listening in this room. Unfortunately, we've lost some. Um, I did want to say um, we have the chief of police um, representative, right? You're, what are you again? The, 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 he the chief of the chief of police or something like that? You're the, you're the big, the big guy. So um, I don't think the public understands how your hands are tied. So um, that, that is something I really wish we were able to get out to the larger group here tonight. Um, they, they are unable to, and I'm not an expert, you are, and, and I wish you would speak to it, but they're unable to hold the juveniles. Um, this is not one arrest or two arrests or three arrests. I, I encourage any of you to watch the press conference that was held on the Capitol steps by the Republicans. It was about a week or two weeks ago now um, on this very subject. So it's available online and I can send you a link if you email me. Um, the chief of police of New Britain spoke at that time and he said that they have one individual who's been arrested 15 times and he's still out there committing violent crimes. Um, one individual that's been arrested 25, I'm making this up, 25 times, maybe something like that. And then the topper is one that's been arrested 40 times and he's still out on the streets with like automatic weapons charges being turned over to his parents. So what I really, really need everybody to understand is there is a huge uh, accountability gap and a common sense gap here, okay? I want our residents to understand this and I want you to get angry and I want you to get active and join our organization. Um, I feel that we need a panel of government representatives and residents that meet continuously until this problem is solved. Um, I want a piece of legislation um, called Henrik's Law in memory of Henrik, because let's not forget him, and I know there are other victims, but he comes to mind. Um, I, I do not want to wear a bulletproof vest to pack my car for work. Um, 
So, so getting back to how the police's hands are tied, please educate yourself about the Police Accountability Act, the no chase, and the catch and release. Christine, you need to wrap up. Okay, thank you. Um, and also, I would like to ask the Glastonbury police to put more miles on, on their cars. Make sure you're, you're logging miles and not just sitting in parking lots. And with that, um, please send me an email, safestreetsglastonbury at gmail.com or safestreetsct at gmail.com and join our efforts. And thank you. John, everybody. you're next. Oh, can I just say one more thing? I would like to find out how I can get a one-on-one -on -one with Ritter. Okay, uh, and I'm 100% serious about that. Please. Mano a mano. Your time is up. Okay. John, followed by LaShawn, followed by Jim Gorman, I believe. Hi, my name is John Poriello. I'm a resident on Main Street. And I'm here because our current program of catch and release simply doesn't work. We need consequences. I've heard a lot of rhetoric from our elected officials that they're going to do something. Well, some of the something that was introduced in the past leg legislative session by Representative Amy Bellow, and I don't know if Kerry Wood had co-sponsored this, was a bill that included an apology from the young criminals to the victims. It's totally misdirected. Elected officials, including Governor Lamont and Representative Bellow, are the ones that need to be apologizing to the victims because they have fostered an environment that is creating toughened, hardened criminals that will become adult criminals. We need to stop this. We need... We need mandatory jail time for repeat offenders. We need mandatory jail time for first time car thefts, regardless of the age. We need mandatory jail time for, for gun, illegal gun possession. And none of the bills include this. So any rhetoric that, oh, oh, and what we don't need are studies. We don't need any more studies. Take the money that would go to studies and contribute it to the Boys and Girls Clubs where it can actually be used effectively. No more studies. And whoever voted for the police accountability, AKA the police handcuff law, you should be ashamed of yourselves. You have created an environment for police where they cannot recruit because who would want that thankless job? Who would want to, be, to put their own life on the line when they're not being respected by our legislators? I've had it. I have had it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, LaShawn, have you spoken? LaShawn Robinson, I believe it is. Jim Gordon Goodwin. Dean Chamberlain. How you guys doing? My name is Dean Chamberlain. I'm from East Hartford. Uh, I started a crime watch group five years ago, believe it or not, for the same thing. Uh, I didn't get my vehicle stolen, but I had $4,000 worth of equipment stolen out of my garage. I pursued it. I worked my butt off and ended up getting 18 months on a guy that did it because he was an adult. Same kind of thing should happen to children, you know? I, I, I hate to say it, but maybe not a big lockup area where like a main prison or anything like that, but these children need to be reformed in one way or another. Um, we have to remember that we run these people. Doesn't matter who, who they are, doesn't matter if they're Republican or Democrat. If we stand in numbers as people, and as citizens of this state, doesn't matter what they say. We can overrun anything that they pass or don't pass. We just gotta rally for it. We just gotta stand together as a community and tell them this is what we want done. The numbers here, sure, they're great, but they're not what we need. We need like 30, 40, even 
15,000 times what we got here. We have so many residents in this state that, have been fed, that are fed up with this. We all need to stand up. Sure, this is just a little part of the chapter. I live right next door, right in East Hartford. We have the same problem. Um, we're having a meeting on Wednesday night. Our state reps will be there as well. I'd like to invite you guys to come and maybe teach them a couple things. I liked what you said. You know, uh, I heard every word of it. And then you told us not you told us not to turn our lights on, not to scare them away. Let's call the cops. Why? What are they going to do? Pull up behind them and watch them? Bye. Really? Really? Their hands are tied just like ours. Sure, I don't want to go out and get shot at. I don't want to stop them. I, I hear what you're saying. But who are we supposed to call? We can't call the cops. You want us to call 311 and have some kind of psychiatrist come over and talk to them? <laughs> really? I mean, this is what you guys set us up with. Everybody, every one of you, Democrats, Republican, whoever voted for this law, why? That's like putting a military guy into the middle of a war without a gun and a, and a suit. I mean, really, no armor, no nothing. We got to change it. And if these people won't do it, I'll tell you what, I've run pl plenty of rallies. I've run plenty of things where we can get people to stand up. It's our word, not theirs. Thank you, Dean. Sure, thank I'm you. a diehard Republican. I always have been. Dean, thank you. But all the rallies we've held, John, 4,000 people, that's what we need. John Jennings. You're not a John. I'm not John. I'm Jen Jennings. That, that's okay. That's my fine handwriting. Print. <laughs> so I'm Jen Jennings. Mark just made a comment, and so did Kristen, about, you know, bulletproof vests. So my husband's at work right now um, in an inner city just a few miles away from us, probably, I think at this point, on hour 14. He comes home around hour 16 for his third day in a row. I send him to work. He kisses his wife and his kids goodbye every day. And I could tell you in his last 10 hours, the same juvenile's been arrested twice. So now what happens when he leaves Hartford tonight and that juvenile comes to Glastonbury and these Glastonbury officers get to pull him over, arrest him, or something happens, and they have no idea just how dangerous that offender is. It is not a complex issue. It is so simple. I understand it's juvenile crime, and we want to seal the records. We want to reform those kids. But we're talking about officer safety. So am I concerned with public safety? I am. My neighborhood actually has been hit three times, four times, in the last five, six months. But I'm concerned about my husband and his coworkers, my brother in an inner city, and his coworkers. What are we doing to protect these officers? What are we doing to make sure that they're aware of the records? It's a very simple fix. And it's not the judicial branch, and it's not the justice system, and it's not our town council. It is certainly our legislature who changes these laws and creates these laws for you guys to enforce. So police accountability. I want to make sure everyone in this room goes to the cga.ct.gov website and looks at how your legislators voted with regard to police accountability. And I can tell you, with the three of them sitting right here, you can thank Senator Casano and Representative Doucette for voting in favor of that law that has caused the chaos that we are now living. Hey, thank you. I apologize in advance for massacring your name, Rachna. Rachna. Okay, thank you. Um, Paul Richard, uh, that's followed by uh, Miriam Therox, Thoreau, all right. Yeah, Paul, go ahead. Uh, I'm a new resident to the town of Glastonbury, less than a year. Thought that this was going to be a great place to live, love the town, don't like what's happening and what, what I'm seeing now. Um, first, I'd like to thank the police. They have a miserable job with their hands tied behind their back. 
They come to work every day and try and do the best they can. Shame on us for putting them in the positions we put them in. In, regard, in regards to the juveniles that we encounter, they have no fear of the police. How can the police effectively do their job when there's no fear? Key words, no fear. So Attorney Colangelo and Attorney Hamilton, I understand your perspective. You're wrong. There has to be consequences. You cannot have a change in a person's behavior without consequences. While the offenders are juveniles and we want to protect their rights, yes, for the first time offender. Second time offender, they are just as bad as an adult. They are, as, they are seasoned criminals. We will not fix this problem with intervention programs. You stop bad behavior with consequences. No consequences, no change. Repeat offenders know what they're doing. They're trained to do what they do. They do it time after time, and they're going to continue to do it until we take the action to tell them once, yeah, you get a free ride. Twice, you're an adult. Within reason, they do deserve a second chance, but not all the time. Representative Barry, you are the only person today of the people that spoke that had a plan. Your words were great. Actions, hopefully, you can follow through with. Buzzwords like get in the weeds, that's garbage. Those words are meaningless. Pushing crime to other towns, which is what you inferred, garbage, meaningless, because they're pushing it back here. Uh, saying we need to take action means you haven't, won't, or can't take action. You're ineffective. And you need to recognize that. Like they said before, look in the mirror. Because if you're not doing your job, there's somebody that wants it. You are part of the problem if you're not fixing it. Everybody here is part of the problem. Even we are because we're allowing you to do what you do, nothing. In closing, take action, take a stance, get tough, or get replaced. Uh, Miriam? So my name is Miriam Thoreau, and I'm on the Town Council on Rocky Hill. Um, I just, first of all, want to thank Glassenbury for holding this forum, and I fully support the efforts that Gla uh, for Glassenbury Council. Uh, when I work with my constituents in town, um, first of all, I'm trying to encourage them to learn how to protect themselves because safety first. But I also listen to their concerns, and I've listened to uh, the recommendations of our police chief, and I have collaborated with and continue to collaborate with my state rep to come up with some solutions. Uh, many people feel that there were no uh, bills that were proposed, and there actually were several bills that were proposed, that, and some of them were quite good. Unfortunately, many of them died on the House floor. The negotiated bill that came out of the Judiciary Committee had some teeth, and uh, I took action and filed testimony supporting that bill. Unfortunately, much of that was gutted as well. However, the fight is not over. We have negotiations going on, and I'm very confident that there will be a special session and that it will pr uh, produce uh, some good bills that have some teeth in it. So what am I going to do? I'm going to follow those bills. I'm going to file testimony supporting th those bills as well. And as our police chief said the other night at our town council meeting, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So I am encouraging my constituents and all the people in this room, follow the bills, file testimony, file your proposals, give recommendations, and I think we'll get a better result this time. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy LeBranche, followed by Patty Beckett. Kathy LeBranche, she's in Rocky Hill. So did I do justice to your last name? Yes. Oh, Patty Beckett. Um, I'm a resident of Glastonbury. I have been for over 50 years, raised my children and some of my grandchildren here. Oh. Sorry, I'm not good at this. Uh, I'm Patty Beckett. I live in Glastonbury, South Glastonbury. Lived here for over 50 years. Have raised my children here and some of my grandchildren. 
Um, I think all of us have a common goal here. None of us like how scared we are or could be of the things that are happening, not just in Glastonbury, but all around our area and the entire state. Um, I think there's a lot of good people working on this issue. But I think besides talking about punishment, which we have always done in this country, and if you look at it, you don't really get a lot of good results from that punishment. And if you put kids into a detention center who don't know a lot, and they sit around and watch TV and play cards and talk, they come out and haven't learned a lot. If you put them in a adult prison, they come out and learn how to be better prisoners. Or, excuse me, better prisoners, yes, but also better criminals. I suppose, or I propose, that we do something different and for instead of punishment, think in terms of rewards. These kids, uh, many of them, from what I have heard, have been recruited by adults who don't want to go to prison, so the adults recruit these kids. A lot of them are coming from homes not like ours, they're hungry, they don't have a home, they don't have a place to go, they haven't gone to school. I think that we should use the database that I think Jill Berry suggested. And when a kid is arrested or is picked up, we look at whoever the town is, looks at that, says, okay, this kid has been arrested twice before, or picked up twice before. He goes into a mandatory program for one to two years. And when we put him there, it's very structured. It's 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. They learn how to read and write, which a lot of them don't. They learn basic math, which a lot of them don't. We teach them skills so that they can get out and do something. We teach them management for anger, for community building, how to be a good citizen. And if they need counseling or therapy in drugs or in addiction, or in any other area, because many of them come from distressed families, then we ought to give them that. And at the end of that two years, hopefully, they are going to come out as good citizens, perhaps go on to school, get good jobs, support a family, and become taxpayers. And that seems to me a much more positive approach than just putting them in jail. Thank you. Thank you. Patty, followed by Brian Comerford, followed by Jim Zeller. And Jim, you're the last one who has signed up. That's a comment for you. Uh, you got it. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kathy LeBrant, and I moved to Glastonbury in 1992 with my son. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, and I want to, the first thing I want to say is that Grand Theft Auto is not just a video game anymore. Um, and that we need you, as well as the police, to protect us. And it appears that just listening to and proposing things is not protecting us. Um, it's one thing to listen, it's one thing to say, hey, this would be nice, but when nothing gets done, it isn't nice. Um, I think that it would be a good idea, as someone suggested, to have specialized police, not just more police, but specialized police. I know that people talk about the defunding the police, but I don't think anybody's really done that yet. Um, I know they talk about it, it's sort of scare tactics as far as I'm concerned, but what we really need are police that are specialized, but that's a side point. Um, I do think that the majority of the people who are committing the crimes that are being committed are not just young kids who are out, you know, let's, uh, let's take a joyride. I don't think those are the kids. I think the kids are the ones that you're talking about, the ones that are wanting to make money to 
to do things that are really negative. And I think that we need to do more to get them. And I think we need to listen to our law enforcement to find out how to do that. And I think we need to make some plans and carry them out as far as how to do that. Um, I, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the, some of the things have already been said before. I don't want to say them again. Um, but I also do think that we need to get to the kids before, while they're still in school, before they get to a point where they're not going to really care about what they do. They're not going to really care about hurting other people when they start to show the examples of how, you know, when that of doing things that might be questionable. Stand and I know up. I'm up. <laughs> I'm <right>. done. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Everybody. And you're Kathy, right? I'm Kathy, yes. Kathy. Okay. So Patty's next. Patty Beckett. All right. Brian. That's followed by Jim. Thanks. I did not expect to get up and say anything tonight, uh, but after I listened to Senator Cassano's deep concern about second chances and heard his public safety tips on how we should all can all avoid being uh, victims of crime, uh, I, I felt compelled to say something. You know, I, 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 don't, I, I really don't want to feel like I'm living in Fort Apache. Okay, and as far as second chances go, I'm wondering where the second chance is for the poor gentleman who was killed in New Britain, okay? To give you an idea of the type of people we're dealing with, my son-in-law is a police officer. God bless him, I worry about him every day. He was telling me he was responding to a motor vehicle theft. While he was responding to that theft, the, the youths, okay, stopped at a gas station and hijacked yet another car. And then the officers had to break off the chase because, it, you know, of high, for being forbidden to engage in high-speed chases. Let me tell you something. Chip Beckett's right. Somebody's going to die here. You've got a lot of guys in this town. You may say, well, gee, okay, if something happens, call the police. That's not going to be a lot of people's first instinct. They're going to be on adrenaline, okay? They're going to be mad. And they're going to be defending their families and their possessions. And one of these days, you've got a lot of people in this town who are hunters, who are ex-servicemen, who are ex-cops, who own guns. And one of these days, one of these happy hooligans is going to take a shot at somebody. And that somebody is going to fire back with a double-barrel 12-gauge shotgun with double lot buck, okay? And it's not going to be a pretty sight. And instead of uh, shoveling somebody off of somebody's driveway down the road, I would suggest that you do everything you can to change the law so that we don't get to that point. But there's one other suggestion I have. The Glastonbury police are amazing. I've had occasion to call them. They're there in like a nanosecond. But this is a big town geographically. Now, when, when the gangs were running wild in Hartford, the governor, and I forget who it was at the time, it may have been Jody Rell, deployed the state police. I realize that, you know, it's, we, we have a lot of towns affected by this. But by the same token, we have roughly 1,000 state troopers. And rather than having them out handing out traffic tickets, maybe they should be bolstering and backing up our, our police by, by adding additional patrols in the various towns that are being victimized here. Just a thought, but you might want to take it up with the governor. OK? And that's, that's about it for me. Thanks.
Jim, it looks as though you will have the final say for the public yeah, park. One more speaker, very important. One more. Oh, that's fine. Oh, all right. Jim, you're not going to be the last. Go ahead. Good evening. Um, my name is Jim Zeller. I was just, I was just tallying this up, and uh, I just completed uh, 43 years in law enforcement. 21 with West Hart. Thank you. That included 21 years in West Hartford, where I retired as a detective sergeant, and recently 21 years with the state of Connecticut as a juvenile investigator. So a couple of things. First, if you folks are serious about this, and I mean no disrespect to the members of the DCJ, there's no one in this room tonight who knows more about juvenile law and what we need to do than that gentleman, Fran Carino, who spoke earlier. So you get a hold of him, and he'll help you with that. That's the first thing. The second thing is to the legislature. Um, do not believe any of the numbers that judicial, ju the judicial branch gives you regarding juvenile crime. I could spend an hour explaining how they move those numbers about. As to um, getting records, we are very fortunate in Connecticut. We actually have a single repository for juvenile records. There are states, believe it or not, where it's by county, and you can chase this stuff all over the place. I know because I did it. This is nothing more than the judicial branch not sharing with the police the information that's available. It's not complicated. The detention center is open 24 seven. That supervisor has access to those records and to any notes that probation officers have entered into their system about the kids they're supervising. This is, and if you don't believe that this is just a, uh, I wanna be careful what I say here, that this is not a, 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 a something to do with judicial, is that me? No, no, oh, no. Oh, I'm no, sorry. No. 20 years ago, Fran Carino and I first requested access to juvenile records without having to go through the court operations or the probation uh, people. As I stand here tonight, that has yet to happen. The juvenile prosecutors and their investigators do not have access to that information. Now, that's not a big deal. Judicial people work with us, and I don't want to make it sound like everybody's thwarting our prosecutors. But it's absurd. It shows you just where we're at. The last thing I would say, and again, I mean no disrespect to the chief. He was my last boss that I had. We have to decide, is public safety our number one concern, or is rehabilitation, which is a much longer term thing, and I'm all for that. I don't have a problem rehabilitating kids. But if you don't have kids somewhere who are repeat offenders, you can't rehabilitate what you can't find because you released it back out into the street. Thank you. You're next. You need to let us know who else wanted to speak who has not spoken before. You want to stand right behind her? Uh, I'm sorry. Hi, my name is Anna. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, hi, my name is Anna Dubiel. I'm from Rocky Hill. On June 29th, I lost my good friend, Henry Kudelski. He lost his life because when he was running, he got a hit by this guy who was arrested 13 times in three years. And he was a runner. He was running on a sidewalk. He did everything correctly what runner should do because I'm a runner and now I'm so scared to run even on the sidewalk on the street I don't know where we s where can I be safe I don't know yesterday I went running I was like looking the left right was afraid that gonna somebody gonna come and kill me because I'm running on the sidewalk and I came here to ask you I want to answer I really do want to answer why this guy who killed my friend who was on the street was still not in jail and killed my friend. Why? What kind of law it is? He's a, he was the same. He was a very healthy man, 53 years old. He was, he was training for his 41st marathon. I don't understand why this guy, oh my God, I'm sorry, I'm so devastated. Why this guy who was arrested 13 times, he, he stole the car and was driving 
and drove it to the sidewalk, and my friend ended up on the another side on the street, and he's dead. <laughs> my friend lost his father. I lost my friend, and I'm not safe to go running. I'm scared to go running on the side. I don't know. Can you guys tell me when I'm supposed to run? And why this guy was on the loose? He was arrested 13 times in uh, three years. Please tell me. I just don't know, because that last month, when I went to his funeral, I'm like, what is this? <laughs> what is this? Oh my God, it, it's not, it shouldn't happen. Absolutely, it's unacceptable. <laughs> Thank you. I, I told myself, I told myself, I'm not gonna leave tonight. I'm not gonna go home. I just wanna answer, please. I wanna know, because I don't know if I, tomorrow, if I'm gonna go around. Okay. <laughs> Please, you're going to get one. Hang on. <laughs> I'm sorry, because okay. this funeral was last You've asked night. your question. <laughs> and I felt that maybe I could better, but I'm not sure. Oh, Miss, yes. hold on. The, in that situation, uh, the prosecutors in New Britain were making the arguments to the court to detain someone. They were making the arguments to the court. Um, the individual was actually on probation for another offense. Uh, the probation officers, you know, the, the prosecutors made all those arguments. Um, I, I don't know why he was out. I don't know why it happened. Uh, you know. <laughs> so, and so you think I'm safe if I go tomorrow, run on a sidewalk? I ra my friend was running in a bright colors. He was running on a sidewalk. He was running at 7 o'clock. It was bright. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you know, I, I think we all understand the tragedy so this is, and the sorry, pain. I, came to just I know that answer wild, is not a complete answer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, sir, now, I, I'm not going to debate you. Um, I'm sorry, that's not why we're here. But I, I will tell you that the prosecutors in that case did everything they could, right? We're, we're using and applying the law that the legislatures give us. We're making the arguments based on that law. I, I can't, I'm not passing anything. I am telling you what we did and what happened. If you don't agree with it, then you, we're here to talk about that, right? We're here to talk about those policy decisions that the legislatures make that give us the laws that we have to, to, to argue. Look at the law to see what the... Why are you looking at here? Look at her and answer her. Look at her in the eyes. Tell her why. Look at the two representatives over there. Look at her in the eyes. Look at her in Okay, please. All right, please. This is not... This is not the way change. you behave. It has to be... Has to change. Miss, I, I understand that. I'm sorry. Okay, I, I understand. You've made your point very powerfully. You have made your point. There was one other individual. My name is Bianca Stanescu, and I'm a resident of Glastonbury. I was not prepared to talk tonight. I came to listen and see what everybody had to say, but. Um, I hope that this session is recorded because I don't see any one of you guys taking notes. I'm speaking because I took notes tonight. Ma'am, right behind you, you'll see a camera. Perfect. There you go. So that's why I said I hope because I teach ice skating and this situation, it's been like a hockey game where everybody's passing the buck for the last 10 years and nothing has changed except for the worst. We've all grown up knowing that actions have consequences, and they are consequences for our actions. Yet we live in a society right now where we don't have consequences for our actions. We look at bail reform, we um, have uh, police reform, 
Uh, we teach our kids in school of all this entitlement, that they're entitled to this, they're entitled to that. And then we wonder, why are we here? And I wonder why we waited for so long to get to this point to ask ourselves, why are we here? We need to speak up and we need to actually look at what are we doing and we have to look at situation. I understand that there are children out there and everything got amplified in this past year because again, what do we do? We close the schools, kids have no activities, and then yet we wonder what are these kids gonna be doing? And of course the inner cities are gonna be hurt more than anybody else. The family unit, or I should say the fight against the family unit, has been running rampant. And as soon as the single parent homes have started coming up, the crime rise 70%. Yet, we're teaching our kids in school right now that family unit is the wrong thing to do. We're trying to turn the kids into activists. No, we're actually turning them into criminal doing, taking that path. We need to instill value in them. We have to look that actions have consequences. Second chance, absolutely. Does it mean a bracelet? No, we have to teach them hard work. Why not community service? My neighbor had a party and somebody brought some booze while the parents were away. She was sentenced to a 40 hour community service. Why don't we put these juveniles community service? Maybe they can work in a prison and clean the toilets and clean the hallways. Maybe they can clean the parks in the towns. Do something till they learn the value of hard work. Thank you. You Teach them what up. they need to do. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Rick LaRose. I live here in town. I've been here for 35 years. I'm not going to say anything that hasn't already been said tonight. I can't improve on what everybody has said. Thank you to everybody who did come out tonight. Uh, what I want to address is something to our legislators. You heard for the past three hours various aspects of the problem that is just pervasive throughout our communities. I want to be respectful, but it took the government all of just a couple of weeks to shut the entire state down over a virus. I would think with kids out stealing cars, with kids out shooting at houses, the sense of urgency is much greater. This is a matter of, is there the will to do anything? Three hours in this room is great. It was wonderful seeing the cameras here. They should have stayed for the whole thing. But they do what they do. I hope that this does not end this dialogue. I hope that our new representative, Ms. Barry, is, is able to get some of her initiatives through. And I hope that the three of you who are kind enough to come here tonight take the concerns back to leadership, starting with your leaders and the gentleman who sits as the governor of the state. Because <laughs> Councilman Beckett is 100% correct. It will be too late when there's a death. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Thank you. OK. Is there anyone else who has not yet spoken? If not, um, this evening's over. Thank you for coming. Drive home, be safe. <laughs>